resume. The second thing I'd like to uh, deal with before I do my more detailed uh, scene setting would be some introductions from uh, the main parties and anybody else who is likely to speak in the in the course of the, the day. Um, if, you, if you don't uh, 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 actually identify yourself now, I'm not going to stop you speaking later, but uh, it would just be useful to know who's likely to, to contribute. So I'm going to turn to the applicants team first and uh, ask them to introduce themselves. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Lee Henry, CEO at Jersey Development Company. Thank you, sir. Good morning. I'm John Nicholson from MS Planning, uh, representing the applicant. Thank you. Uh, is it just the two of you? It is. Oh, if we come on to uh, other housekeeping matters briefly, um, we have been struck down by the fog. Right. Uh, so we have a okay. decimated team. The uh, Delta um, assistant has uh, got everyone uh, online and they will be joining uh, my teams uh, as per the um, parties okay. identified on the we'll uh, program. Talk, Thank you. We'll talk a bit more on that soon. Uh, to the planning authority. Good morning. Um, representing the planning authority will be myself, Wendy Johnston, the case officer for the application. Um, also with support from, sorry, you, uh, I'll just be Chris Jones, senior planning officer. Um, we also have here um, Alistair Coates, who was um, involved with the drafting of the Southwest Helia Framework Supplementary Planning Guidance. And later on, Tracy Ingle, who will be dealing with townscape and visual impact and heritage. Okay, thank you. And to others, is there anybody who knows they're going to speak uh, on some of the matters later? Yes. Mr Young. Uh, yes, John Young. Um, I used to be, for my sins, used to be the minister, uh, and I've had a long-term interest in planning matters. Obviously, as a, a citizen of 45 years in Jersey, I think it's such a huge issue for the community. So I'm here in my personal capacity. So uh, hopefully, you know, I did all the inquiries, but it was the new minister that decided on the whole setup. And I was Sam. involved in, in your appointment. Every conference is required. <laughs> thank you. Um, OK, thank you, Mr Young. Anybody else who... Who's... So we have witnesses for the uh, later sessions. Um, some of them are in the room. Ah, right, yes. Do, do you want to, to run through those? Hi, thank you. Look, my name is John Fielding. I'm from Hesser Architects. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Mike Waddington, local architect, also working with HETA and uh, the Gillespie's JDC team. And I'll also be talking about, about design related matters. Sorry, I missed your surname. Uh, Waddington. Waddington, okay. So if I might uh, just revert to the uh, other two, uh, the other two witnesses um, we have on the Teams link, uh, checked with uh, Del Tony he is there, uh, Patrick Conn uh, from uh, Gillespie's. Uh, we are just waiting for uh, Sarah Gibson, uh, also of uh, Gillespie's, to join the uh, the link. Which she has tested, so it should be fine. Okay. Confident with that. Okay. Patrick is on the screen, uh, back of the room. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's all the introductions. I think there is an attendance list uh, somewhere on the... Uh, it would be useful just, just to have a record of uh, everybody attending. Okay, well, let, let me just do some more detailed scene setting and just explain how... Uh, the, the inquiry will, will operate. Now, last month, a number of uh, participants here 
uh, attended a pre-inquiry meeting with me, which was uh, a, a very useful session because it enabled us to uh, take stock of uh, the impending inquiry and take some soundings in terms of witness numbers, uh, and that then enabled the programme officer and myself to put together a programme, which we, we issued in draft to the, uh, the main the main parties I'm referring to the applicant and the planning authority and it was uh, further refined from that some of it was related to witness availability uh, and uh, I think we've got uh, really everything uh, covered that, that should be um, I think um, it's important to just contextualize the inquiry week in terms of the job of work that I have for, for the Minister. At, at the end of this process, I have to produce a detailed report with recommendations on the planning application for, for the Minister. And instantly, the Minister has decided to form a, uh, a panel that will actually decide this rather than it just be uh, his decision alone. That, that uh, I think was confirmed late, late last week. But the inquiry week for me is it's a very important part, but it's part of a much longer process. I was appointed in January, uh, and since that point in time, my little office has been uh, overwhelmed with paperwork that, uh, that I've been, been working through, uh, paperwork and also the, the electronic files. So I have done a pretty good study of the application documents. Um, I have done a pretty good study of the statements of case uh, that have been, been made in respect of the, the, uh, the, the inquiry. And in recent weeks, I've been working through all of the proofs of evidence that have been submitted. So I come to the inquiry, I must admit my brain is probably in a little bit of a jumble, but uh, I, I have, uh, if there is a document related to this application uh, or a, a representation, uh, it has passed in front of me. I have seen it and I, I have, I have uh, read it. Um, so the, the, the value of uh, this week, very much um, a, a public session, it's an opportunity uh, to explore the evidence that's been submitted. Um, and it is, I, I see it very much as a, an opportunity to shine a light on, on evidence. It's not a place to introduce new evidence or uh, introduce matters that other parties might find as a, as a bit of a surprise. Uh, it is to really explore uh, what has been <coughs> submitted. And in terms of the way inspectors operate, um, we like policies and we like evidence. And that is very much, uh, people look in at the planning world and see it as, a, as very complex, but uh, um, we will, as we go through each of the topics, you'll see that I want to ground my analysis in terms of, you know, if we're talking about a specific issue, whether it's heritage, uh, waste generation or whatever, what do, what do the actual policies in the Bridging Island Plan tell me? Because um, it's those policies that I have to apply and then I need to look at the evidence from the application and see, well, what does that tell me and how does that relate to those policies? Does it simply tick a box or is, it, uh, is there conflict or uh, are there issues where you've got some shades of grey where it might partially satisfy a policy or, or not? And in that process, I'm going to be very interested in the submissions of the planning authority and, and, and expert consultees. Uh, and it is through inquiry sessions that I'm able to uh, explore uh, those, those those topics. What I did say at the pre-inquiry meeting was that the number of witnesses and the scope of the range of issues that we need to cover in the course of a week is quite challenging. Um, there are a lot of witnesses, there are a lot of, lot of issues um, and there's a, actually a huge number of policies in the Bridging Island Plan that are engaged in, in, in this application. Uh, it, um, uh, it, it, it does cover uh, a lot of policy areas. Um, so, as we go through uh, each of the sessions, um, what I want to ensure is that um, everybody that's participating 
you really don't need, need to make long speeches to me, and you really do not need to read out uh, evidence that is already put in, in writing. It is very much about um, uh, cutting to the chase, and highlighting the, the things that uh, you regard as important. I mean, in simple terms, particularly for, for the main parties and indeed the interested parties, your contribution should be telling me what I should write in my report to the minister. You should be trying to persuade me that on whatever issue that we're talking about, this is what I should write to, to the minister. Uh, I am evidence-led, um, and uh, that, that would be my steer to uh, each of you. Um, in terms of the formalities or, or otherwise, we agreed at the uh, pre-inquiry meeting that uh, this isn't going to be an inquiry which is based on barrister-style cross-examination of difficult questions and trying to lead witnesses up a, up a certain path to uh, uh, trip, <laughs> trip them up. And uh, it, it's going to be much more inquisitorial. Um, and at times, it will go into uh, a, a much less formal round table type discussion. And that will be particularly the case where I know that there's a fair bit of common ground between uh, the, uh, the main parties. Um, when we do get to uh, witness evidence sessions, there is an established running order in planning inquiries, and I'm going to stick to it most of the time. There will be some times where uh, we, we, don't, uh, we, we can depart from it to, to save time. And the usual order, and I did set this out in a little note that accompanied the programme, uh, is that the applicant's team uh, gets to go first. So they, they will present uh, their evidence. They, um, th they are then allowed for their own team to, to, to ask them questions. I'll then ask the planning authority if they have any questions. I'll go to the, 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 the gallery and see if there are any questions for, from the public. And then I might ask some questions at, at the end. Um, and in, in, a, in a very formal setting, the applicant's team then gets a chance to ask some further questions of their witness. It's what's called re-examination. Um, that may or may not be, be necessary, but we, we, we'll see uh, how, how it works out. Um, Yes, I, yes I, I mentioned, just to make sure I cover all, all of this, that uh, there are going to be some sessions where I know, particularly through, uh, that there's been some statements of common ground that have been produced um, uh, that, that have appeared very recently. I know that that means that some of the sessions uh, can be very succinct indeed, um, uh, where, where there isn't... Um, I might have a question or two on particular issues, but uh, we... Um, don't need to spend time on matters that aren't be being contested. Because we've got a lot of issues uh, to cover, what I'm going to do at the start of each day is just take a reality check from the applicant and the planning authority in terms of how long they think uh, their contributions are going to take at each of the sessions, because that um, we haven't got any slack in the programme in, in the week. We cannot uh, run... Uh, you know, we've got three sessions today. We can't get to two and a half sessions because we haven't got any time in the morning to, 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 run, uh, to, to run over. Uh, so there isn't really any, any slack uh, in, in the programme. If, um, maybe wishful thinking, if we were to finish all of the sessions that are allocated to a day early, we're not going to start the following day. We, we would just um, uh, close at that point and then pick up uh, in, in the morning. So... I think that's probably enough from me in terms of uh, scene setting. The, the next point, uh, next item on the agenda is opening statements. And uh, I haven't actually checked, but I assume the applicant, you intend to make a notice. Yes. Roughly how long? 15, 20 minutes. 15, maximum. 20 minutes. And the planning authority? Yeah, about five to 10 minutes. Okay. Well, uh, we'll go. Straight to the applicant, then. Oh. Sorry, may I ask a procedural clarification? Of course, I you think can. Procedure, guidance, from you. Um, I, I would welcome clarification on the issue about this is a planning application with all matters reserved. Uh, and though you said in your comments you'll be going to hear a lot of detail today, 
and I'm a bit puzzled by that as to uh, how your, the task that you've got to, to make a recommendation on application which says all matters reserved, which means they're effectively all for another day. My worry about that is there's a lot of important information in there that's just fundamental and not just detailed but fundamental points. Sir. So could you, in terms of how the inquiry is managing it and when, when one should be able to make a contribution, yeah, sure. could you give some guidance where in the process you think that would come in? He, yes. Perhaps maybe, in the, I mean, I see we got the last session as usual on conditions. I'm really puzzled about that, how conditions sit alongside an issue about all matters of reserve. So I'm a bit, I, I accept for being puzzled. I'd like your clarification, please. Okay, th thank you, Mr. Young. It's, it's a point well made, and uh, you will be hearing about that pretty soon, actually, because if you look at the program, uh, the, the session one topics, uh, I've done my introduction to housekeeping matters. We're next going to hear the opening statements from the applicant and the planning authority. We're then going to uh, have a visual presentation, uh, digital model. Uh, it, it, that, that is organised, is it, Mr. Nicholson? You... The digital model is with the planning authority. All ah, right, OK. So, um, yeah. so we're going to have a quick run through. So uh, we, we can see what we're talking about in terms of the application as submitted. Um, and then I've got an item which talks about preliminary and procedural matters, including, discuss the, including discussion on the all matters reserved outline application and the status of plans and documents. So right, you know, in this early session one, uh, I want to answer that point that you made, because it's very important uh, what is being applied for. I have to advise the minister on that. What would be the effect of the planning permission? So we, we will pick that up very soon. Mr Nicholson, over to you. Uh, thank you, sir. Over to Mr Henry. Thank oh, you. Mr Henry. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm delighted to be here today, um, which represents a key milestone in the development of the St Helier waterfront, which started in 1996. Over the last five years, JDC has been involved in establishing a new vision for the waterfront, firstly by providing input into the Environment Minister's new planning policy for the area that was adopted as SPG in December 19, and secondly by developing and consulting on these outline proposals to visually respond to that new planning policy. JDC is 100% owned by the Government of Jersey, company is in effect the government's regeneration arm, carrying out major mixed-use projects, and we will be the developer for this particular project. The company supports and assists with the government of Jersey in delivering its strategic objectives, in delivering outputs that are balanced socially, environmentally and financially. To date, JDC has delivered almost 400 residential units and two Grade A office buildings at the IMC Jersey. We are currently completing the final block of a major residential development on the waterfront and a third Grade A office building. We've delivered and maintained extensive areas of public ground, including Weybridge Square, Trenton Square, Marina Gardens and Lejana de la Mer. And we also maintain the landscaping on route to Port Elizabeth. Placemaking is at our heart and we're passionate about design and ensuring that the buildings and public ground that we deliver will stand the test of time. There's been a step change in the quality of developments on the waterfront since the establishment of JDC in 2012. The proposals presented respond to consultation feedback as well as providing for the needs of the island as set out by the government. The island has a need for 7,000 new homes by 2030. This demand is being created by the continuing trend for smaller household sizes and the requirement for inward migration to support the needs of the island as a result of the ageing population that's causing a reduction in the amount of working age people. The spatial strategy for the island, as restated in the current Bridging Island Plan, is to focus these new developments within existing built-up areas. And from a transport, infrastructure and environmental perspective, this waterfront area provides a natural extension to the town and provides the island with a release valve that will reduce pressure for greenfield rezoning. Islanders who participate in the consultation process identify the need for new residential accommodation and that the waterfront could provide for such use. However, they also wanted the area to be landscape-led 
and for the waterfront to be a destination for islanders and We've taken these key directional markers and selected a design team with landscaping at their core. As a result, 56% of the development area is dedicated to open space and public realm, as well as proposing almost 1,000 new homes. The area will also deliver an active ground plane with sport, leisure, art, culture and commercial uses on the ground floor. Placemaking has been a key consideration in generating a range of spaces and amenities for all age groups and abilities will feature in the new areas of open space and ground floor activities. We recognise that there will be no public finances invested in this project. The JDC is therefore committed to investing 150 million in public infrastructure in the, in the area. This includes new public parks, new public squares, new pedestrian and cycle streets, creating a tree-lined boulevard on route to Port Elizabeth, uh, sorry, route to Liberation, uh, like route to Port Elizabeth, um, delivering a new sports centre that will include an indoor 25-metre pool and a gym, a 390-space cycle hub for commuters, below-ground public parking, enhancing vital sea defences and the relocation of the West Park slipway. In addition, enhanced connectivity with a new pedestrian crossing on the dual carriageway will, no, will, will remove the severance effect that currently exists and once and for all connect the town to its waterfront. This is the most significant consolidated piece of underused brownfield land on the island and it's essential that we get it right. We are genuinely very excited by the proposals and look forward to further engagement with the community as these plans evolve to ensure that we line with expectation and requirements. Thank you, and I look forward to the inquiry. Over to John. Thank you. So, um, unless you're taking notes, I'm happy to circulate this opening statement. That is oh, that would be helpful. Thank you. Use of reference. Uh, so thank you, Lee, for that introduction. Thank you all um, for assembling here this week. Thank you to the Planning Authority for all your input to date. I just wanted to talk a little about why we've gathered and to provide a short introduction to this application. So first of all, why are we here, sir? As you've introduced, the former minister called this application in for his determination. It's understandable, given its scale and the site history. The current minister then appointed you, sir, as the independent inspector, asking through the terms of reference to hold a public inquiry to consider the application against the policies of the Bridging Island Plan and to deliver a report with a recommendation. We know from these call-in reasons that the Minister does not consider, at face value, that the application is a departure from the island plan. So first of all, I think it's worthwhile considering what the island plan is. To take a step back, the planning law requires that in general terms, you have to apply for permission to undertake development. That application is then assessed for accordance with the island plan, taking account of all material considerations unless there is sufficient justification to depart. The island plan is required by the same planning law to provide policies for the orderly, comprehensive and sustainable development of land in a manner that best serves the interests of the community. This structure provided us with what we know as the plan-led system. As you've pointed out, it's a complex document. During the week, we will probably unearth some of its nuances, and the introductory pages of the plan help us with guidance as to how it is to be used. The plan states that when considering whether, whether a proposal is in accordance with the plan, it's important to have regard to the plan as a whole, and not to treat policy or proposal in isolation. It's likely that several policies will be relevant to any development proposals. Some policies can seemingly fall in different directions. This is not a flaw in the system, but simply a product of a complex and wide-ranging plan and a reflection of the natural tensions that arise in seeking to meet the community's economic, social and environmental objectives. It's for the, the, it is for the decision maker to carefully balance the planning merits of a proposal with the policy requirements of the plan. That is uh, taken from the introduction and sets the scene well, sir. The, the island plan then contains a series of strategic policies. These provide high-level guidance on key issues and overall objectives. They include 
directing growth to areas of previously developed land or locations that minimise the need to travel by the private car. It sets a spatial strategy that confirms development is to be concentrated in the built-up area, particularly the urban centre of town. It requires that developers make efficient use of land and optimise the density of development. As part of the spatial strategy, this will reduce pressures for greenfield land release and protect the character of our countryside areas. Improvements are sought to active travel, promoting sustainable transport as part of a desire for meaningful and long-term reductions in carbon emissions, alongside supporting proposals which provide resilience to, to the impacts of climate change, such as flood risk. It asks for the delivery of environments where people will want to live, with high-quality open spaces, facilities and services that create environments where communities will flourish. Alongside delivering a sustainable economy, protecting our historic and natural environment, the plan is quite clear that it must serve the interests of the community. Expressly set out and central to this is ensuring that everyone has a safe and secure place they can call home. To quote, in the creation of strong, healthy and sustainable communities, this primary need must be fulfilled. This aligns throughout government strategic policy and ministerial objectives. When we delve deeper, it is clear we have a very serious issue with housing. The island plan requires that rates of delivery should be doubled from the averages achieved over the last 10 years. We have dramatically failed to deliver sufficient homes to meet our community needs. Rather than double the rates, in recent years, the rates of permissions being granted are actually slowing. One of the background documents to the island plan Helping to set its strategic objectives is the Urban Character Appraisal Review. This acknowledges the development dilemma. How do we deliver the complexities of meeting housing demands focused on St Helia alongside the problems with a limited supply of sites and the high value we place on the character and sensitivities of town? The new waterfront is considered by this character appraisal to have a low sensitivity to change. It is specifically considered to act as a safety valve for development with an emerging character that is positive and supports good placemaking. It's acknowledged in the character appraisal that there is a development dilemma. The downside of delivering these needs is the potential for impacting on, for example, the setting of listed buildings. Even so, this guidance advocates a massing of up to eight storeys throughout the new waterfront area, ranging from Gloucester Street all the way down to Elizabeth Harbour. This is specifically carried forward into the plan, aligning with the strategic policy objectives. The Minister has indeed provided further guidance in the form of the South West St Helier Planning Framework. This is adopted SPG and acknowledges that there were problems with previous guidance and master plans. It sets a loose framework with a series of community expectations across key opportunity sites. It advocates for ongoing engagement with a clear desire for improved connectivity, enhanced open space, a vibrant mix of unit uses, high quality and sustainable architecture, and for maintaining key views. The scale of development is expected to be in keeping with that found in the local context. Buildings of up to seven floors are discussed, including reference to even taller buildings where justified, leaving the door open to significantly increased heights with as it suggests, a single, elegant, landmark building of mixed units, use having potential for this area. In this context, the island plan acknowledges that its policy framework will deliver the objectives of the new St Helier waterfront. It seeks to create a new quarter for town, which has become better connected to the beaches and shoreline of St Ovens Bay. It is within this matrix of clear support and policy promotion reflected in other material considerations and wider statements of government policy that the project team have consulted upon and produced the application that we are here to discuss. I've got a fly through if uh, Delta wouldn't mind running that. Thank you. So, this is an outline application. With all matters reserved, it seeks to bring 
It seeks to bring forward the objectives of island plan policies and show how they can be met with a vision for the waterfront. It is not a prescriptive master plan. Neither is it a full and detailed proposal. It is a step towards realising the aspirations of the island plan and SPG within a framework of ongoing engagement that takes these policies off the page and transposes their objectives onto the site. Delivery will be through a series of reserve matters applications on a phased basis, likely over a 12-year period. Existing buildings which have no inherent aesthetic value and present a visual barrier separating the town from the waterfront will be demolished. The phased new development comprises, as you introduced, 984 new homes in a mix of one, and two and three bedroom homes with apartments and duplexes. There is new social infrastructure, there are new leisure facilities, new arts and cultural enterprises, and new local needs retailing coming together to create the desired vibrant new community. It's set within a network of car-free public and private open spaces and landscaping. It includes new office buildings to supplement the International Finance Centre. The high-level objectives, sir, are to connect with the old town. There is an at-grade crossing of the dual carriageway as part of a coherent space, uh, a coherent series of landscapes and human-scale spaces. It supports active travel by making the most efficient and effective use of land in a spatially appropriate location. It balances modest levels of car parking with excellent cycle provision and excellent new public footpath links. It helps to deliver long-term climate resilience. If you could play that again, please, uh, Delta. It adds up to 1.5 metres to the seawall, infills around the current slipway, and this is re-provided to the west. This benefits the site and the wider St Helia businesses and residents in accordance with the Government of Jersey shoreline management plan. This approach is supported by a full range of technical reports and an EIA with illustrative material such as this fly-through to convey the project aspirations within the framework of the four approval package. Sir, there is a great deal of information that we will review during the course of this week. It's my opinion that this application is a positive and compelling package. It accords with the island plan and other material considerations, and it should be welcomed as an important step towards delivering the vision for the waterfront. I know, as you said, sir, you've already embedded yourself in the application material. We look forward to assisting you, answering any questions and providing clarifications. Sir, we sincerely hope that you'll present a positive recommendation to the Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Nicholson. Um, over to the Planning Authority. Thank you. Good morning, Inspector. The Southwest St Helia waterfront application is of island-wide significance and the method for planning determination is best served by holding a public inquiry with an independent planning inspector. The Minister for the Environment envisages the inquiry will be an inclusive forum to ensure open discussion with all parties being able to present their opinions and have evidence tested prior to the inspector making a recommendation to the Minister. The desire for an open forum to understand scrutinise and appraise the application comes through the Minister's terms of reference and your pre-inquiry note. The South West St Helier application site is in a highly sustainable location on the waterfront of St Helier, with policy support for a mixed-use development on the site recognised in the Bridging Island Plan and the South West St Helier Framework Supplementary Planning Guidance. The site is currently underutilised and in spatial terms, the principle of a residential-led mixed-use scheme in this location is supported within the context of the strategic policy guidance. Notwithstanding these positive site attributes, the application site has a number of constraints and challenges which have influenced the proposed scheme. The site is in multiple land ownership which has influenced the aspirations for the scheme and potentially complicates delivery of aspects of the framework vision. The site sits within a sensitive gateway location to the town when approached from the west, with the Grade 1 listed Elizabeth Castle immediately offshore in the protected coastal area, 
and the Grade 1 listed Fort Regent providing a backdrop to the site. It also now includes the Grade 2 listed La Fregate. The site comprises made ground with filling of the seabed taking place in the last 40 years. Whilst large areas of the filling comprises demolition and construction waste, this is mixed with incinerator ash known to contain concentrations of heavy metals. Ground investigations have also revealed the presence of asbestos. Historic infrastructure, including seawalls, drainage channels and culverts, are also known to exist under the site, and the site is hydrogeologically connected to St. Oban's Bay, which presents challenges when excavating substantial areas of basement infrastructure. The site is also bisected by one of the busiest roads on the island, which presents challenges for connectivity with the town, and the application site hosts the only cinema in Jersey and the only public swimming pool in St. Helier. Since its original submission, the applicant has modified the scheme to address concerns and feedback raised, received from consultees, the community, and other key stakeholders. These modifications have resulted in improvements to the scheme. However, notwithstanding these modifications, the Planning Authority maintains a number of concerns with the proposals. Our submissions to the inquiry cover planning policy, the historic environment, environmental health, landscape, townscape and visual impact, liquid and solid waste, ground conditions, flood risk, ecology, sustainability and transport, with the intention of assisting the inspector in reaching a clear and robust recommendation. Of particular note, the application is predicated on waste arisings from the site being disposed of at the government facility at La Colette, which is the only contaminated waste facility in Jersey. This facility currently does not have the benefit of planning permission for the disposal of contaminated waste, including asbestos. A planning application which sought permission for the disposal of waste at La Colette was recently refused by planning committee, but ratification of this decision was delayed for six months. The operator has been given six months to submit two planning applications for consideration. One, to seek retrospective permission for the contaminated landfill cells constructed to date. The second, to seek permission for future disposal of contaminated and inert waste at La Colette, until such time as other options for disposal can be identified. The La Colette facility has been allowed to remain open until the planning applications have been considered but with the understanding that the existing headland constructed to date cannot be added to, except for the requisite capping material. The applicant of the waterfront scheme makes the case for possible export of contaminated material off-island. In this respect, contaminated material for export must be considered suitable for recovery only, not simply disposal. To date, it has not been demonstrated that this matter can be satisfactorily resolved. There are other areas of the scheme where the bridging island plan is challenged. Impacts on heritage assets and the wider townscape of St. Helier have not been managed or mitigated to an acceptable extent. The scale and massing of the built envelopes obscures important skylines, views, and vistas. The prior provision of alternative swimming pool and cinema, arrange cinema arrangements remains unresolved. And to the extent that a solution is suggested, these alternative arrangements have not been consulted on or assessed as part of the application submission. Impacts on the St. Helier retail core have now been assessed as part of a retail impact statement provided by the applicant during the week prior to the inquiry. Retail impact was identified by the authority as a matter of concern to be addressed as far back as June last year. The existing surface water sewerage infrastructure for parts of the scheme identified in the Government of Jersey's drainage impact assessment as surface water catchment one, is insufficient to receive the proposed surface water flows. The application as submitted does not provide a solution to this issue, and general residential amenity impacts warrant further exploration. 
Notwithstanding the above concerns, we have issues of process, particularly in the way information in respect to the proposals have been drip-fed into our overall consideration. And I can use the example of the retail impact assessment. Sir, we hope this inquiry can properly explore the issues I have referred to and those additional issues which other parties and consultees may raise so that the public, you as the inspector, and ultimately the minister as the decision maker are aware that there has been a robust assessment, putting the application through due scrutiny and leading to a clear recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've not been advised of anybody else wishing to make uh, an opening statement, but um, I'll just look around the room if anybody does. Mr McCarthy. I need to switch it on. No, he'll just recognise your face. Thank you. Um, it's a very sad day uh, today for me to come here. Um, because we should be really celebrating what was originally intended was homes for islanders we'd all be proud of. Um, on a 11 hectare site, you could easily build homes uh, as they have achieved through community uh, projects throughout the UK, um, over 1,000 new homes. But we also don't need to dig up the most hazardous waste not just hazardous waste, the most dangerous hazardous waste of chemicals, heavy metals, asbestos. So, and we don't have a choice. It's either this or not. And this is why I hope the inspector will say no. The other bit I wish to, I'm a, I'm a Jerseyman. I've worked internationally, I'm an engineer and I advise on projects, sustainable projects worldwide, based on scientific evidence. And when we prepare a planning application, we work in consultation with the local people to understand what their concerns are, and then we develop options. And from those options, you can assess the harm. And when you assess the harm, you can then choose the, the solution that the public want less harm. And on this, uh, you expect the applicant to provide you with the necessary scientific information so the public, or they can seek advice from people like me, to advise them of the degree of harm. Not will I wake up feeling miserable because the buildings look awful, but will I die prematurely? Will I die prematurely from inhaling one micro speck, the diameter, a tenth of the diameter of your hair, from asbestos, which is dug up, then is carried by the wind, which you then inhale? And then 30 years later, like my brother, who was a Jerseyman who worked his whole life here, died prematurely within this first month of his retirement. These are real. They're not if, they're just who. So the bit I will now stress on the necessary information. I'm not, uh, everything I've read is unsound. What I mean by unsound is that since 2018, since the islanders eliminated their independent environmental health and environmental protection department, there has been no independent assessors of the harm that will be caused by this government's own developments. I would also stress that there are things called international anti-government corruption agencies. I'm not suggesting that anybody's corrupt. But if they're seen to be corrupt, it's as harmful to the community. It is depressing. But what's more depressing than being harmed, or perceived to be harmed, is being harmed by those people the islanders have elected to protect them from that harm. So 
I'm now just going to focus on the information. The, one of the statements which was missing is that it states the planning department of GHE, which is now IHE and now it's IE, um, also stated there is inadequate information. Inadequate information to whom? It is inadequate information for the public to consider. This is all reserve matters. What's that mean in simple terms? It means we're not telling you anything. We just want you to give you planning. And then later on, we can work with the officers and get planning approval without any public consultation under delegated powers. And this is to circumvent the public's participation. And I see it here today in public participation, although people may be online, how disappointing it is to see this development is for 3,000 people. This is a new town. It is huge. And yet, the amount of people that have followed the process, there's only three people from the members of the public formally requested to, to attend, formally, and there's only me that's provided evidence. So I will apologize from the start. You may hear me at every single topic, not because I want to, because nobody else has submitted any information. And I will stress, this is not going to be about me criticizing the, the degree of the information, the correctness of the information. My comments, they haven't produced the information. And that information that has been produced is contaminated with conflicts of interest. Having the environmental impact assessment provided by the same consultant that did the horizon. And it was the horizon that re released toxic and hazardous materials into our sea, which probably I'll be eating when I eat the next oyster. So the, this is the fundamental problem. The other aspect, which is not a planning issue, although it's becoming a planning issue, is the subject of environmental social governance. This developer, on behalf of the, the, us, the landowners, because we own the land, who's been gifted by the Queen to Ireland, it's not to the government, states they will provide environmental social governance in accordance with international best practice. International best practice. And I can speak on that. The fundamental thing is, the basic thing you have as a company is an environmental management plan. Because you need an environmental management plan to implement the environmental impact assessment. But there isn't any. So that's why we ended up with polluting our sea. The second thing is the environmental impact assessment does refer back to options. And what it does do earlier on is consult on the scoping of what you want, Mr. Public, or, uh, Mrs. Public, what do you want all kids at school? What do you, what's your concerns? What do you want this environmental impact assessment to, con to consider? There has been no consultation. So the aspect of this planning application, when I can help Islanders by comparing it to the UK, another fellow learned inspector, when a planning inspector attends meetings like this, especially where the government are assessing their own planning applications, especially, they scrutinize it much more, especially with a developer that says they're working to the highest, highest social, uh, environmental social governance, which we depend upon, the whole finance industry is dependent upon that standard going forward, is that the environmental aspects that are missing from this development, I'm going to try and highlight. And from that, I hope, 
that we will understand this is another colossal waste of taxpayers' money. But what is crying shame? It's been stated we need these homes. Isn't it a disgrace they're going to use people's desperation to have somewhere where their kids can sleep in separate rooms, where kids can play, where kids can learn, where pe elderly people can stay at home and breathe fresh air? Isn't it a disgrace that a lot of this development doesn't provide any natural ventilation, doesn't provide any solar access? doesn't provide any interesting views, apart from the person next door getting undressed. That interests. It doesn't provide tranquility. You can't open your window. Most of this development faces the main road. And I'll tell you now, you cannot open your window. You have to mechanically ventilate it, and you have to pay for that mechanical ventilation in your energy bill. And as far as talking about sustainability, which I'm sure we'll hear all from this developer, this is not a sustainable development. It's produced by a board of directors of accountants. It's just blocks. And as far as misrepresentation, I looked at the model, and I asked people to be very wary what they're looking at. It does not show the balconies. Now, balconies are huge concrete slabs sticking outside the building. They take away daylight. And you're obviously cheek and jail to your neighbor. So watch that model, because it's a misrepresentation of the application. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Right. Um, <coughs> OK, so we're next going to go to... So I wonder if there might be... Uh, point of clarification on a couple of matters arising. In, in your hands, if, if you... You don't normally do that in opening statements. I mean, I'm sure you heard lots of things that you disagreed with. Um, two, two matters of fact. Um, go on, then. Try me. Uh, first of all, uh, EIA scoping report in response to uh, Mr McCarthy. Uh, scoping opinion uh, was sought. Uh, and no response was received from the planning authority. I'm aware of that. Uh, the second point is uh, the status of the application for the uh, extension of Black Hole Air. I believe, an uh, open question, uh, happy for this to be clarified, I believe that is not refused. It is deferred for six months. There's no decision notice has been issued. The case officer is here. So there is a live That's application. That's my understanding is... Yeah, resolution to refuse, which wasn't ra ratified at yeah, the no, subsequent. No, no decision notice has been issued. Well, we will obviously yeah. deal with that in some detail in the session, whatever it is. Thursday, yeah. Dealing with. Uh, Ms. McCarthy first, then. What is important is the, so we understand, the public agreed to fill in that collect with inert, inert waste. Oh, yeah, I can eat it. What has happened unlawfully, New Jersey law unlawfully, international law unlawfully, this developer has excavated, delivered, and dumped the most a slag heap of hazardous waste, which they do not have a license to do, <coughs> which is a two-year imprisonment. And First of all, before you can get the license, you have to have, in accordance with Jersey law, a planning consent. So if you don't have a planning consent to fill a hazardous slack heap, you don't have the license. And we need to focus on the license, because that is international okay. law. Right. I don't want to have this discussion now because we have a session, session 12 on Thursday uh, that... Uh, we will do this in some detail. So there were others indicating they wanted to say something. Um, Mr. Young. Uh, thank you, sir. I should be brief. Um, I think, yeah, certainly, I think I, I tend to agree. I just say that uh, on the question of the waste arising being a fundamental issue, and I don't really see it as a matter of detail. So it's fundamental to the whole natural application, but we'll talk to that when we get to that item. 
I think my general view is that I did uh, write a forward to the St. Helier uh, Southwest Development Framework. And I think the whole context of that um, is one of, um, a one of, if you like, integrating uh, St. Helier, sorry, integrating this part of the waterfront with, uh, with the whole of St. Helier, which I think means is that we really need to have a clear understanding of how that integration is going to be achieved in all of its various aspects. And I think we've heard from the planning officer very well, I think, a number of issues where I think there are still major questions of principle. And having read my forward in there, I, and I look from what I can see at the application, because I, it's hugely complex, it's got overwhelming, it's rather overwhelming, frankly, for a layman. When I'm a layman, I don't have access to emails or state documents anymore. Um, I find it difficult to, for, to, to, to be confident that this plan now that you're asked to review actually meets the vision uh, of those sessions. And having attended them, I think there were high, high hopes. There are a number of specific issues, I think. I think they've been uh, picked up well by the uh, planning officer, and I support uh, uh, pretty well almost of what has been said there. Um, but a couple of extra items. For example, we still do not have clarification, any, and we did not achieve it in the Bridging Island Plan, of how we are going to provide for the school spaces for the, uh, for the, um, the uh, children arising from this new quarter. We're here developing, you know, a thousand new homes. Uh, people might say, well, it's all right, they're going to be wealthy yuppies. They're not going to, you know, uh, they, they're not going to be affordable homes and therefore um, they're not going to generate any children. I think that's, that's an issue on itself, which we don't have the island plan failed to resolve the issue of town primary schools. Um, we can't ignore the fact that there's at least one town primary school which has to be replaced, which is Rouge Brion, that issue. So we're not maybe, and there was a report recently that we weren't just looking for one town primary school site, but two. And in fact, you know, this area is one of the last areas available within the density of development to do that. So I didn't see that on the agenda and it wasn't mentioned. So I think that's something which is an extra reason why my feeling is, is that it's, it's too premature to approve this because we haven't resolved that. Uh, I'm going to do the infrastructure issue. We're going to deal with that on your list. There's also the issue of the Port of St. Helier. They've got major plans. We, we know very well um, that the, we don't have the full shoreside facilities for importation of construction materials. That's an issue on its own. We saw that in the Bridging Island Plan where the state's kicked out the opportunity of using um, sustainable sources, which that we now need to have provision for that. And so I don't see how that fits into the application. That seems to be an almost a matter off, which has not been uh, picked up. I think um, parking standards, I think, is another long overdue matter. Um, the last SPG on it is about 1986, I think. And so that really is highly material to the issue about whether the development proposed is sustainable in terms of cycling and so on, uh, and, um, and use of public transport. Um, and so the, the public transport issues, I'm hoping we're going to be able to deal with that, uh, in particular, particularly this issue of traffic links. And one point I'll flag up now, the island plan, the, the planning framework does make provision, includes the, the requirement that infrastructure for bridge links other than ordinary crossings should be looked at within the uh, within the south, within the plan, that's something that I insisted on, and has always been, in my view, a possibility. If there, uh, because of the doubt about whether that um, the, the measures to manage traffic are any good, so there's a whole host of issues which I think I think were quite neatly encapsulated by the Constable St Helier when his proposition he put to the states to say that um, that there should be a development plan for the whole of St Helier to help us link this particular area. My worry, and I, th I was disappointed that that was withdrawn because I think that was an important debate. It didn't happen. And so we have to rely on this process here, sir, now, today, uh, to be whether or not we can have, uh, whether or not we end up with a plan which integrates uh, what is uh, the future of St Helier with uh, what is done here 
or whether we end up with um, a piecemeal uh, development. Uh, so, and I think I don't know, I think um, there are lots of ish open space is an important provision. Uh, I, I think um, that you know the balance of open space uh, and development is is not quite right. Uh, so, I think probably I don't want to hold on any more. So, but those are issues that I hope we get to cover in the inquiry. I think I'm not against this. I think we need a development proposal, but, my, it, but Mr. Nicholson said that this is neither a prescriptive master plan. <coughs> or a detailed application. I think that's what he described in his summation, which means this is, sits in between the middle. And it's, it's being asked, I think we're all asked to agree, this is a framework which will help, which will last for 12 years. 12 years. And we so we won't need another inquiry for 12 years. Well, I, I find that really, really difficult to believe. And I, I did have the question, listening to what that point that Mr. Nicholson said. Um, why do we, if that's the case, why do we need this inquiry? Why do we need this permission in place now? Is it not a business plan for SOJDC to devaluate money, a forward business plan, rather than a planning application with, uh, you know, that sets out all the details? So I asked that question, sir, and I'm hoping you'll, at the end of it, I'll be able to answer that from what I hear. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Young. <coughs> Lots of questions there, and hope by Friday you'll have some answers to, to those. Okay, well, that's the opening statements. Um, I think we're now going to have a run-through of the digital model. Is that the case? We can do that now. Um. <coughs> Um, so just a couple of words, this is a 3D massing model um, showing the proposed development uh, in context. Um, it's not as detailed as the fly through we saw earlier, uh, but it's really, this is just presented as a series of blank blocks essentially. Um, we're able to <coughs> toggle uh, back and forth between the existing situation and the proposed situation. And really this is just a, um, a tool to enable um, you, sir, to sort of have a, a, a viewpoint from any position <coughs> where you, you would find it helpful to be able to look back to, to, to see the development in its context, um, either from either within the site or from um, further afield. It's quite a large model in terms of its site area. Um, and <coughs> we've actually extended the original model boundary um, to actually include um, the for example, Fort Regent, Elizabeth Castle, you can see there, and also um, parts of Victoria Avenue um, and the seafront heading west. It is quite a large model, so it's quite data hungry. <laughs> so it, it may be um, a little bit sort of slow and sort of juddery at times with a, a low frame rate, but really it's there as a, a tool um, to sort of enable us to, uh, to position the, the viewpoint from anywhere. Um, I can just sort of <coughs> lie around generally, or it might be perhaps useful at other sessions to be able to drop in at particular viewpoints, or if there's any particular concerns. Um, could, could you take us um, sort of the <coughs> the journey from the town centre, as if we were walking from the town yeah. centre over towards Aqua Splash? And so I can, in a second, I can lower us down. In, into the head height. Um, along, the, along the sort of marina front, or this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's start over there. Perhaps we could do that. And if you do some toggling off and on so we can see it as we, we move along. Yeah, so I'm just sort of obviously ho hovering up in the air at this stage. Um, but that's the existing, existing situation. Um, that's the newly emerging horizon development there in the grey. Um, so what I'll do is drop down a bit more. Proceeding along uh, past Liberation Walk. Um, so 
and you'll find that it's in places it looks a little bit crude, and that's just a function of the model. Yeah. It's not highly detailed, as I say. It's there to provide a more of an overall sort of massing. Um, so we'll go along the top of the underpass. Again, it's the existing aqua splash. And so that, that's the leisure centre of the, the, and, the and, well and that's Horizon Flats beyond, is it? The uh, dark that's Horizon red. there peeking up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's existing, and then that's proposed. Um, just, just to be clear, what we're actually seeing here, this is the maximum parameters. Correct. I believe so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Again, it's, it's go back and forth. So these, again, these are the uh, newly emerging um, development at the IFC Finance Centre. Um, I think we we come we come here to the uh, sort of principal crossing yeah, point. Yeah, crossing. Um, so let's do another look around at this stage. So obviously, this is all open surface parking predominantly. Um, so we are so we are able to go into the development, sir. If uh, yeah, that would be helpful. Please do. Apologies, <laughs> a little bit fiddly. Uh, like Wendy can perhaps describe where we are. <laughs> if you yeah. are you able to? So we've just gone through central. Oh, can I get down there? Square. <laughs> and we're now moving. This is between block D one and A one. Yeah, it's perhaps a little bit unclear because. That there isn't any detail applied to these textures. It's within. very blocky, isn't it? It's very blocky, and you can't always perceive. You can see shadows, um, but you're not always perceiving the sort of individual buildings. Um, perhaps if I just sort of pop up into the air, we can have a look down. Gives you, so that's the so Radis yeah. Radisson Hotel. There's a the hotel there. <clears throat> the Horizon. Yep, so we sort of really, we were there in the central street, um, effectively. Um, so let's, uh, let's drop down again, possibly. Take us out towards the uh, Jardin de la Mer yeah. Gardens. Yeah. I'll stay hovering in the air slightly. Yeah. Landscaping is indicative at this stage, I think. Yeah. yeah. So. So we're sort of hovering there over the um, pedestrian sort of promenade, um, the, exist the existing Le Fregat Cafe. Yeah. Um, and obviously there's the land re reclaimed area, the Fregat relocated to the west. So, in your hands, sir, really, <laughs> if that was helpful. Or <clears throat> Any 
more viewpoints from any of you think? Do you want to look from any of the viewpoints well, from I Fort Regent, Elizabeth Castle, or any of those other? That that would be it'd be helpful. We'll have access to this later on, where we. Um, yeah. I think it'll be more relevant then, but you, yep. you might just want to show some of the uh, more outlying views, toggle on and off. I, I don't know if you go to, I don't know, someone like First Tower or uh, ju just have a look back. Yeah. Um, I think the model almost extends to First Tower. <laughs> Let's see how far we get. West Park. Just anywhere which will give you a look back so you can okay. see so this is the, 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 the change in the townscape. Yeah. Um, it's probably more helpful to come down to the, the view that yeah. people are actually going to see, I think. Um, so that's uh, obviously on the cycle path heading out of town. So that's existing. Um, there's Horizon, Fort Regent in the, in the distance, the Radisson Hotel, and uh, that's the, the area of new infill, of the new of La Fregat there. So that would be the change as you sort of approach from the west. Perhaps move along to Move in a bit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm struggling to pick the detail up on that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I say it gets a little bit. I wonder if the sunlight might change so the buildings are illuminated rather than in shadow. Um, I can try that, John. <laughs> Again, the one um, tool with this model is the ability to change the, the sort of time of day <coughs> and the day of the year. Um, you can see from the bar at the top the, the time of day. In the best the early morning, maybe. No, I think that's um, that might throw it out too much. Okay. Yeah. Let's go the other way. Yeah. Um, keep going. I think. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's quite I, good. I think we'll just yeah. try and take it from there. Jump in the air a little bit. cycle route. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously this is where it now now starts to change as we approach West Park. Mm. Past the, the new the frigate. Okay, well yeah. maybe we Pick it up in more detail in the... Absolutely. I think it's there. As somebody wants to yeah. know, can we see it from Fort Regent? Yes, absolutely. We're able to yeah. do that. And we'll okay. pick it up in session two and three yep. uh, later on today. Okay. We have the lights back on. Um, for those looking, although it, it is a bit clunky and, and blocky, it is quite a useful tool. It's um, that UK authorities don't have this, this sort of uh, level of technology and... Uh, uh, it is it is quite quite useful, particularly when we're we're talking about views. And this afternoon we'll we'll talk about views from Elizabeth Castle, views from um, Fort Fort Regent, and we'll be able to locate ourselves in those positions and and have a look back and see what that does to to, to the view. Um, okay, right. Um, now we've got the um, next item um, a little bit messy. But it's preliminary and procedural issues. Um, and I want to, I'll, I'll come to the outline application issue last because that's quite complex and we, we, we do need to bottom it out. But uh, just um, in terms of uh, some catch up matters on documents, it's inevitable <laughs> whenever an inquiry is due, that, uh, in the last few days, lots of documents start appearing in inboxes. And, uh, uh, it's, it's not ideal, but um, it, it's just just the way, uh, just the, the way it is now. Um, just if I can record, I'll perhaps look to the planning authority first on, on this. Um, <coughs> firstly, thank you for a procedural compliance note, which uh, I received, I think it was the 4th of May, 
that just sets out so that uh, so I can confirm to the to the minister that all of the administrative advertisement and consultation processes have been been carried out. Um, thank you also for the update on consultees. We raised this at the pre-inquiry meeting and uh, are very grateful to the officers for doing a little bit of uh, chasing along of responses because uh, we, we did seem to get uh, some, some more responses and they are uh, quite useful for me, me to include. I think there are still a f one or two outstanding, aren't there? Um, yeah, there was actually... Um, Jersey Water came forward with their comments they on did, yes. Friday. So they on the schedule, they're appearing as being outstanding, but now they're, they're not outstanding. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think who, who sure else... I'm not sure we had there. anything back from the police, did we? We didn't on the revised submission. They gave initial feedback, um, right. quite a detailed report, um, but nothing subsequent. OK, we'll pick those issues up later. Um, statements of common ground uh, for members of the public. These, these are normally produced in inquiry proceedings and uh, they, well, they are what they say on the, on the cover. They, they are agreed statements, typically between the applicant and the planning authority. Uh, and usually that means that uh, I don't need to spend a great deal of time on them. Um, there are, I believe, two that I'm aware of and one that I'm aware of but hasn't arrived. The, the, the two that I'm aware of are one regarding contaminated land and hydrogeology. Um, and the second one is, uh, I'll call it the planning statement of common ground, which I received on Friday. Um, I believe there's another one on transport, but that hasn't appeared yet. Yeah, we haven't been provided with a copy of that. I'm not sure of the status. Well, I think there are, there's more than uh, that to follow, sir. Um, you should have also had uh, from the Planning Authority uh, statements from the ground on waste regulation matters. Correct. That was sent at the end of last week, yeah. So that will be the third one that you uh, should have. I think there are two to follow, sir. Uh, I think the, the technical consultees in relation to drainage and transport are still hoping to conclude a statement of common ground. Uh, they are both uh, well progressed, as I understand, but primarily due to uh, annual leave last week, uh, they are still being worked on. So it's my understanding there are two to follow, sir. Right, let me just check my on here. I've got, if you want me to wrap up with the three that you should have, I've got paper copies. Uh, happily send an updated bundle through the oh, program yeah. officer if that would assist. I haven't got the one on that you mentioned on waste, but I've got a feeling I read it. Uh, I've got <laughs> um, a copy here, if it would. Yeah, I've got copies as well. We can, right. I, I'll, if, for ease of reference and for the record, I can package uh, those three up straight to the program officer, if that would. That would be useful. That would be useful. Straightforward. Thank you. Yeah, do that in the break. Okay. Well, I'll make sure I get to them before the relevant sessions. Okay. Um, so... Just to make sure I've got my notes right there, Mr. Lefler. You, you think there are five statements of common ground. Uh, planning submitted, contaminated land and hydrogeology submitted, waste submitted, Correct. drainage and transport awaited. Correct, sir. OK, that's clear. OK, and let's just continue with other documents that, that appeared. There is what's called an errata document. It started as a spreadsheet, I think, and I think it's now a PDF document. Does somebody want to talk... Mr Nicholson, do you want to talk me through that? Yeah, I, again, sir, I can bundle that up with the um, submitted uh, statements of common ground, so there is a, uh, a consistent, for-the-record copy. Uh, the errata schedule uh, responds, really, to, to two things. Uh, in... 
the circulation of proofs of evidence. There were uh, several uh, queries raised, uh, inconsistencies identified, and um, it was useful that the project team had the opportunity to uh, review those. Uh, they relate in the main to uh, elements which are um, hung over from the uh, addendum, the time of the addendum. Uh, they also relate to clarifications between the uh, parameter plans uh, and codes. We have those uh, set out in a manner which I hope is the most straightforward, identifying uh, the, uh, the relevant document or the relevant drawing uh, and the uh, page and section um, rather than provide a complete uh, further bundle of all the documents, uh, we um, believe the errata schedule provides the, necess the necessary uh, clarification. That has recently been updated to include some um, matters which relate to the uh, transport assessment. They are um, hopefully, sir, considered straightforward matters of clarification, uh, including, for example, car parking uh, numbers being uh, corrected uh, as per the evolution of the statement of common ground. So I have a um, 12th of May update of, of that errata schedule, which I have in paper here. Uh, I can circulate that in the break, and I'll happily... So the, the document the I've got is revision one. Is, your, is that revision two, then? It's actually revision three, so. Revision three, right, okay. Okay, so I'll get rid of that one. Okay, and if I turn to Ms. Johnston, um, any issues around that errata schedule? Um, I think we'll, I'll come on to it kind of in the next, in the next session, actually. Thank you. Okay. Um, Another late document was the retail statement, which I have a copy of. Um, is there anything else that I need to be aware of? Any, any new documents that I've either missed or may arrive? I don't believe so, sir. I think the um, public inquiry uh, website is... Um up to date with the, the, the kind of chronology under the inquiry news heading. Um, you will also have received um, a document from the planning authority with some um, kind of topics identified for conditions and planning obligation agreements. I think it is um, generally accepted that that will evolve through uh, this week, but that is a useful starting point. Uh, which we can all work from uh, towards the final session uh, on Friday. Uh, but I believe the um, um, schedule is up to date. Just bear with me, so one second. Thank you, sir. That's it. Okay. Bear with me a second. Okay. Right. Let's get on to this um, discussion about the outline application. Now, one of the things I'm going to need to do uh, at the front end of my report to the Minister is to clarify um, what the application is for and what the status of various plans and documents means. And you've already heard um, a number of comments on this, this very subject. And I think it's fair to say that having spent my entire life in and around the planning profession, uh, outline applications can get quite complicated. Um, and there are a lot of confusion can arise when uh, people are unclear 
about what uh, is being applied for and the status of various documents. Now, the law is quite clear on this, that the outline planning permission, that is the permission. That is the permission. So what, what is granted at that stage, that, that, that is what the minister is being asked to permit it. But it's never quite that simple. Um, but you do need to start, first of all, with the development description. And the development description and the, the application form. And the development description starts with the words outline application and then in brackets with all matters reserved. And then I won't read out the development description, but it's, it, it's there and it talks about the number of dwellings and so on and so forth. <coughs> And on the application form, which was originally submitted, there are no ticks against those matters that would be reserved. Um, and, and those matters are scale and mass, sighting, means of access, external appearance and materials, uh, landscape. Um, so they're all matters that are reserved for future consideration. But matters get complicated when you're dealing with what's called scheduled development, where the environmental impact assessment kicks in, because there was, well, UK case law basically saying you cannot conduct an environmental assessment on the basis of a, uh, some of us are old enough to remember out outline applications, which were based on a red line on a piece of ordnance survey sheet for to build 500 houses or, or whatever. The world's moved on. And that case law tells you that you need to have some basis to undertake the environmental assessment of. And for, there were a few people uh, that were present in the first hospital inquiry that I, I conducted, and we all heard about Rochdale envelopes and, uh, and, and, and the like, and uh, uh, the various case law re relating to that. And that introduced the concept of whilst you don't need to unreserve all those that you don't need to put a full application forward you have to have the the basis um, of effective what's often called parameters uh, what are the maximum parameters of the development that uh, is is being applied for uh, and I think somewhere in one of your submissions mr. Nicholson you uh, you you do explain this and you talk about assessing the worst case scenario in that it won't be any higher or, or any any uh, bigger than uh, as shown on the parameters plan. I think the problem then arises in that with this application, despite that development description which tells you it's an outline application with all matters reserved and the form confirming that, um, there's a huge amount of detail in the design and access statement, uh, the parameters plan uh, and the uh, the plot guides uh, and the design codes and I have to admit I'm left scratching my head just thinking uh, of the uh, four approval plans which includes the parameters plans but doesn't include the master plans um, I'm just a little bit confused about their status in the whole scheme of things um, and I'm going to ask the applicant and the planning authority to just give me their views and it may result in a bit of homework for them at the at the end of it to uh, explain to me in a note uh, what they think the status of, of the plans is I, I think there there is in the statement of common ground which I only just um, uh, skimmed through I think there's a brief reference to it where you're agreeing that uh, uh, certain uh, plans and documents would be approved, but uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, explain that. So I'll go to Mr Nicholson first. Can, can you help me in terms of, and be, be steered by what I was saying earlier about, tell me what I should be advising the Minister on, on this point, and you've heard some of the, uh, the, the uncertainty views from, the, uh, from, from contributors this morning. What, what am I to tell the Minister? Uh, so I think the uh, volume of information and the, the manner in which it arrives on the uh, planning portal is uh, part of the uh, issue here. 
uh, we have a, um, a consistent position expressed uh, throughout the material uh, uh, as to uh, what is um, for approval and what is illustrative. So I think uh, you are uh, exactly right, sir, in the form of the introduction that you gave. Uh, this is an, an outline application. All matters are reserved. It is supported by uh, maximum parameters. Uh, and it comes with uh, design code as guidance for future designers, the public, and future decision makers. Uh, that is a legitimate form uh, of planning application, which enables uh, the broad acceptability of the proposal to be assessed in planning terms. If I can um, set out uh, exactly uh, our position, when the uh, application was uh, uh, updated, it came in with a, uh, a document issue sheet, uh, and that confirmed the parameter plans. Uh, they are uh, all updated on the planning register. And if I could, you know, for example, take you to uh, this table, which is in the uh, design codes uh, document, it, it, breaks, it breaks down uh, the core documents. It lists uh, the parameter plans. So where, where do I find that? Uh, well, this is just the example that has come to hand, sir. It's the, uh, this is the for approval design codes with the 15th of December. Yep. I'm looking at page 11 of that, and that explains the structure of the application. On the left-hand side there, uh, it explains uh, what the parameter plans are. They are three-dimensional approaches to the, uh, the, the size, the location of the component parts, including the basement uh, and the layout, including uh, open spaces, public routes, um, and plot dimensions, public realm, etc. And those um, parameter plans were scheduled out on the um, document submission sheets, uh, and it is those parameter plans for which, uh, the, uh, by which the application has been assessed for EIA purposes. Uh, they are the for approval bundle, accompanied by the design code summary, as you have in front of you, which is also branded, labelled uh, for approval, sir. The rest of the application package which includes uh, the EIA, uh, illustrative material, is submitted in support of the application. And uh, in general terms, the planning authority may want to clarify their, their processes, but in general terms, those documents are not uh, taken forward for approval in uh, an application of this nature. Okay, a couple of questions from me then. So, and that figure you directed me to on page 11 of the design codes document where it's color coded at the top so you're saying core documents are for approval no sir i'm saying the uh parameter plans and the design code summary are for approval The design code summary. Well, the, the summary document is, if I'm right, that's like the, the main document, but with a few chapters chopped out early on. Um, well, I can explain the, the rationale for that. The uh, planning authority, uh, through a kind of number of pre-application meetings, um, were uh, conscious of the desire to maintain flexibility and not to uh, deliver uh, a constrained hand for future uh, architects and to leave uh, matters uh, loose, for want of a better word, for uh, future reserve matters applications. 
And that, that led to the, uh, the, the stripping down, uh, the uh, editing of the design code document into the, uh, the summary which is submitted for approval. Okay. Okay, well, within the parameters plans, there is this document, it's called Plot Dimensions and Edges. which shows all the blocks and the uh, spaces between the buildings or whatever. If that's approved, how can siting be reserved? Uh, so that, that shows the maximum extent of those um, plot extents and edges. So if, if siting was a fixed matter, then siting would be fixed. Uh, this is a, um, a document which provides the maximum extent of the plot dimensions in, or in all three dimensions, vertically uh, and horizontally. But I'm just trying to test the... So if, if this document ends up being approved by the Minister... This drawing. The, yes, this, yeah. this drawing, the... Um, plot dimensions and, and edges. Does a different layout of buildings, is, is, that, is that possible within the outline permission or does the approval of this parameter plan drawing means that the siting of buildings must fall within this call it a layout for want of a better word, must fall within that layout of buildings. Yes, sir. That, that, and that is articulated in conjunction uh, with this drawing in conjunction with the design codes. So uh, the, the, the layout is as shown on that drawing up to the maximum extent for each plot. Okay, I'll just hang that thought in the air for a moment. And then, if, if I just, in the design case document that you referred me to, if I turn the page to page 13, uh, yeah. it says, Design codes provide mandatory codes in brackets instructions and advisory codes in brackets guidance. And it goes on to say, mandatory codes are key design rules which should be followed when designing buildings and spaces. And it says, unless there are satisfactory reasons for not doing so. It all feels a bit imprecise to me. <laughs> So what does that mean? Um, it, it should follow the, the rules, um, unless what? Um, I, I think the, the intention, as is common throughout the whole theme of uh, the outline application, is not to unduly restrict uh, options which may emerge in the future reserve matter applications. I would say that a uh, satisfactory reason for uh, diverting from a mandatory code would need to be uh, very carefully uh, justified and considered. Uh, but uh, a mandatory code um, may be varied. I would suggest that that is uh, not a normal circumstance and that uh, the reasons would uh, probably need to be unique and examined at the particular moment in time. But um, mandatory is a is a strong term. Uh, if uh, if they weren't mandatory, they would all be advisory. Uh, and I think it is fair to say that the satisfactory reason would need to be quite an exceptional reason. Okay. We turn to the planning authority, um, Mr. Johnston. What are your thoughts? 
we have struggled um, with the, the two key areas for determination, the parameter plans and the design codes for approval. Um, as outlined in, in my proof, there are discrepancies between the two, um, quite significant discrepancies, things like the plot, like the dimensions, the maximum horizontal extent of the built form do not correspond between the design codes and the parameter plan which deals with that. The schedule of errata seeks to kind of, well, acknowledges that and says that perhaps they're measuring different things, but I'm, I'm not convinced of that. Um, but it also doesn't identify every, all of the discrepancies just in that single respect, so it doesn't capture everything. And it makes a difficult situation in terms of knowing what is being, if permission is granted, um, which takes precedent. Um, the design codes also contain a lot of images and illustrations. So for example, if we look at page 24, We have a plan which shows Les Jardins de la Mer, and it has a layout for that area. That layout is also replicated on the physical model over there. But my understanding is this is not for determination, because this layout doesn't feature on any of the parameter plans. But it features here, and it doesn't feature in an illustrative manner. It's not described as illust illustrative. The codes prescribe some aspects in relation to here, like windscreen measures and things like that, and draw them on on kind of like another couple of pages in, you see some other things drawn on. And it's, it's very confusing as to, is there an expectation that, that this will be stamped approved and then the design of this area will emerge as this? Because if it does, then that should be for detailed consideration, and a design code isn't the appropriate mechanism to secure planning permission for this layout. It, it requires a, the, the issue of siting and, and design to be considered at this stage, and landscaping. There are also matters, uh, so if we, we also struggled with the concept of the built envelopes. Um, and how that ties in with siting being reserved. Um, so if we accept that, uh, that the plan that shows the, the footprint of the built envelopes can be acceptable, we don't have any envelope for the land reclamation area. That's not shown on any of the parameter plans. Sorry, don't have uh, uh, any envelope for the land reclamation area. So if you look at the development plot, plan, it shows the built plots on the main waterfront site, but moving down Les Jardins de la Mer, we have the plot footprint for the relocation of La Frigate. But there is nothing to show the maximum extent of the land reclamation area. And if the siting of that is not for determination, it I'm not sure how that's going to be secured through this planning permission. And I, I think this is the challenge that we had. It was like peeling off layers of an onion. The more you started to think about these different aspects, the more difficult it, it became. And then if we turn to page 11 of the uh, design codes, Um, and we have the, the first section, para, a parameters document. And it says, the parameters plans demonstrate the principal components of the proposed development. The amount and uses of development, open space provision, car and cycle parking, and indicative development phasing. But I have a phasing plan on the parameters plans, which to me commits to a particular phasing, and it doesn't feel indicative because it's a parameter plan, which is for phasing. So is it indicative or is it for determination? And then in reference to this, the car and cycle parking, the proof of evidence of the transport consultant for the applicant confirms that car parking and cycle parking, 
the numbers and provision is not for determination. It is indicative only. So it's these types of conflicts that have made it very difficult to us to really understand what a permission would result in. I think, sorry, I was just going to say, so I think as well, um, on the basis that you know, the outline application is the permission, as you say, um, we've been having a stab at trying to work out conditions and uh, makes our job really difficult. We're trying to struggle with what we're actually what we're actually approving, if you know, um, without prejudice, obviously. Um, so this is why this discussion this morning is really useful for us as well to try and get a grasp on what we're actually t you know, determining. And I think, as a as a final point, the the there are two documents for the design codes. Um, there's a design codes document and the summary report for approval. And I know there was feedback from the planning authority prior to my involvement with this project, but also feedback from the Jersey Architecture Commission that they felt that the design codes were contained. A lot of information were, were pres prescriptive and potentially would influence a scheme coming forward. Um, and I don't think what we have in the summary report really resolves that issue because there's, there's volumes and volumes of codes that I don't know how they're enforceable. If something comes forward with reserve matters application that it's not in compliance with something that was prescribed in here, I'd, it's the, the level of prescription in some aspects, like the spacing of trees and street furniture and various things, it, it strays into the area of detailed matters. And so it just question the utility of this as a document for approval, unfortunately. Okay, Mr. Nicholson, I'll just go back to Mr. Yep. Nicholson first. Any thoughts, what you've heard there? Yeah, I think that there is a, um, a, a general desire, which I've heard several occasions uh, this morning, which, which I think is positive for, for more information. Every, everyone, wants, everyone wants more, and they want more now. The whole approach of the application has been to not repeat the mistakes of the past. Uh, this whole area was subject to one full application. Uh, that application, uh, the above ground works were, were approved, and the, the whole project fell by the wayside because it was, it was a, the big bang, it was everything all at once. And it was the failure of that application which led to the um, master plan uh, SPG being uh, revoked, and it led to the whole uh, South West and Hellier framework approach being uh, promoted. That, that approach is, in, in my reading, uh, I think it comes through in, in the document itself, it, it is a step-by-step -step, uh, approach which brings the public uh, on board uh, at every stage, and, uh, and, and avoids the, um, the, the, the messes that will emerge in trying to uh, fix everything at day one for, for a project which has got a 12-year, you know, four-phase uh, lifetime. The project has to adapt and flex standards of, uh, of, of policies uh, in relation to uh, you know, design requirements, car parking, Landscape provision, they, they will ebb and flow and, and you know, uh, uh, change during the life of the, of the application. And, and, the, and the proposals have to be able to flex with that ebb and flow and the community expectation that goes, that goes alongside that. So what, what we are uh, proposing, it does have all matters reserved. The design, design code uh, is guidance. Um, some of it is, is mandated, some of it is advisory. And, and that... It is the purpose of that is to is to set a direction of travel. Uh, it is to provide people uh, with comfort uh, and to uh, explain how the expectation from the island plan, the character appraisal, and the framework is pulled forward into the application. It, it is not intended to fix uh, matters such as landscape for the um, western approaches uh, play area. Th those matters are are not fixed. Um, 
in relation to uh, one of the points that came up was the um, reclamation and the extent of reclamation. That is shown on uh, the scaled drawings. The, the extent of reclamation is, is as proposed. And one thing that the errata schedule do, does is to um, add a dimension to that, um, uh, to that uh, parameter plan. Um, so that it can be, can be read in the same way as the rest of the uh, annotations. But the extent is there, and it's shown scaled on that drawing. Um, we, we, it, it, is, it is exciting that people want more information. They want to know uh, how it is going to look when it's finished. But we need to be uh, aware that that is not the nature of the application. It, it is uh, about the broad acceptability of the three-dimensional forms, uh, plot layouts, and the phasing, which is one of the uh, parameter plans. Uh, and it is about um, having the ability to make um, reasoned judgments through the EIA and through the degree of certainty established in the codes about those reserve matters phases. OK. Is it possible to? Come back just on yeah, one, one comment there. I th um, just to clarify, our request is absolutely not for more information. It is for better definition of what is illustrative, what is for determination. And it really feels that the level of information submitted is not commensurate with the matters that are being brought forward for determination, which is really very simply plot outlines. Um, so it makes it difficult to understand why some of those matters couldn't have been for determination at this stage. It's, it's almost gone from one extreme to the other with the previous permission you referred to, having everything for determination and it proving unsuccessful, and now we have nothing for determination effectively. Um, and I think if, sorry to do this, but if we go to the Rochdale envelope principles, one of those principles is that if you are seeking this level of flexibility, you have to explain it and justify it. And it doesn't feel like this application does that. Um, there's reference to, well, this is a, a long development period, and so we need flexibility. But that's, that's not unique to large-scale regeneration projects. And nothing is set in stone. So you know there are options to, to vary matters, and it, it just feels like so much has been um, left for future consideration, yet there is volumes of information at this, at this time. Okay, um, Mr. Young wanted to say something. Thank you, sir. I'm grateful for both uh, the opportunity to hear Mr. Nicholson explaining the approach, that, the procedural approach that SOJDC has taken, and the planning authority for uh, explaining the mismatch, if you like, that that approaches, uh, that highlights with the planning system, whether we like it or not. You know, the planning system as it is, it's defined in law, and uh, I think everybody, applicants, the public, have to work within it. And I think what uh, I heard from the, uh, from the SOG developer here is that, um, no, I don't think over, it's an issue more than information, it's about being absolute clarity the public will need clarity on what is being approved and what is, the, where, what is still t to be determined. And of course, process is vital here because this is public land. It's the major area of public land. It's hugely, it meets the criteria by a country mile about why we need a planning inquiry because it, it affects the you know, very large portion of the population of Jersey. And they will want to be confident and see in the process that they know what is been approved and they've got an opportunity to have a say and understand. And yes, there, of course there need to be changes. Nothing is ever cast in stone, as I absolutely agree. I agree with the, well, the planning officer's position entirely. I, frankly, I'd be, uh, given the fact that, you know, the planning system is run by uh, lay members who are, form the planning committee, um, not every matter goes to uh, a public inquiry such as this. In fact, there are legal challenges. You know, recently there was a legal challenge 
sir, which is on the record now, which there are, you know, we don't, these inquiries are not held every day. The assumption I make is if what is, illicit, what is not, uh, what is determined is, fi is fixed. Uh, and what is still to be determined, the reserve matters, means that they will not go through, I don't believe, a, a public planning process. They won't go through uh, further inquiries. They will effectively be done, uh, I don't believe, in a system where the public has access to. Because if the planning officers have struggled with trying to follow these documents, I certainly, uh, I found it overwhelmingly difficult. And I did wonder whether or not this application should have been accepted at all on procedural grounds. Simply that, that there's no clarity. Because after all, this application has been in, in since 2021, before the Bridging Island plan debate. And of course, we've been through iterations of loads and loads of amendments and changes and statements coming right until, I think, if I heard it correctly, the 4th of May. And so it's like been aiming at a moving target. Mm. And so I, I think that, I, I'll be frank, I think me, if I was the minister, I think I'd think this is an abuse process. I'll be honest. Uh, because it confuses everybody. And I don't, I, I, I don't envy you the task of trying to unscramble this, because we're all here now. We should try and get the, what we can out of this. But I really have major, major reservations about this. You know, if we are to proceed on the basis of, well, these documents are the planning application, and these documents are not... For, uh, for approval, we need to have that clear on all of the websites because at the moment they're all intertwined. If we've got the planning website which sets out the documents chronology, then we've got the uh, core documents list now from the been put on there, and we've got the inquiry documents, and you've got a cross refer, and this one is for approval and this one is not. I, th I think that's all too confusing. I'd like to see that list reclassified. These are the documents for approval. This is what you're being asked to report on to the minister. And yes, you're entitled to take into account illustrative material, but they won't be definitive. So, so I, I go on. I think I've made my point. Mm. I don't want to go okay. on anymore. I don't Let me just um, throw something towards the applicant and the planning officer. Well, firstly, a question. Uh, I'm assuming, because nobody's pointed out, that the Royal Courts have never had a look at these issues, have they? Um, not that I'm aware of, sir. No, I, I've um, followed the lead set in the um, examples I'm aware of in Jersey, which include the uh, first future hospital application, as you referenced. OK. And you're not aware of any court cases? <sighs> There is, there is a UK case that does get cited. Um, I, made a note, I haven't got a copy of it with, with me, but you, you might want to look it up. It's um, called Crystal Property, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L Property, uh, London Limited, and it's against the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government and the Borough of Hackney. Uh, it's... It's always dangerous to summarise um, <coughs> High Court judgments, but in effect, my reading of it was that if, if matters are reserved, all matters are reserved, drawings that you provide can only ever be regarded as indicative. It's worth a look at. Um, I've got to admit, right now, my head's in a bit of a muddle on this, this issue, and it's been useful to hear uh, the, these contributions. Um, I don't want to spend a huge amount more time on it, but I'm going to invite both the applicant and the planning authority to submit a note to me um, on this subject. Um, I'm not going to get you to agree <laughs> right now. That's, that's, that's clear. You've got differences of view. But uh, I'd like you to do a short note for me. Uh, have a look at that case. Um, there's all, also been reference to the... Uh, there were a couple of Rochdale uh, judgments, weren't, weren't there, uh, when, when, when that went through. And my challenge to you is to provide a note that helps me to guide the minister. 
um, and deal with those issues of uncertainty that Mr. Young raised. I think the Jersey Architecture Commissioner ra raised uh, uh, some issues as well. Because I think, particularly from the applicants, you need to address that view, uh, and it might be a cynically held view, that what you're doing here, whilst you're reserving all matters, you're not actually, because you're trying to get them approved by the back door through um, the uh, design codes. That, that, that would be what a, a cynic would, would, would say, that actually, um, when you look at the very detailed design codes, it almost feels like you've got a design there and it's a bit like painting by numbers, that you, you, you've, got, you've effectively got your layout determined and then you go to the codes and you sort of assemble the design of a building. Um, and I think what I was picking up from Jersey Architecture Commission, given the length of this um, development, you could have a situation where I don't know, another architect comes along, it's, uh, another, uh, as you mentioned, Mr Nicholson, uh, policies and, uh, will, will change and, and, and adapt. Uh, and you want to make sure you don't get caught out by having hand-tied yourself to something yep. in 2023, which is all a bit passe in 2030 or yep. whenever. whenever. But that, that's fine. The, that approach uh, has been, uh, in our minds, it's something we absolutely discussed with the Architecture Commission. Um, and uh, if if the degree of change is uh, to the uh, of the magnitude that the uh, expectations move outside the position which is uh, within the design codes, then there are other routes to uh, progress uh, applications on the site. A, a distinct full application could be submitted for particular parts of, of the building if those circumstances stretch beyond the, the terms which are uh, being d discussed now. Um, we, we don't have a crystal ball. Um, that flexibility uh, is, is absolutely not removed through this, uh, this approach, sir. OK. So you're, you're comfortable with your homework? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So could I ask that in those notes there's absolute clarity about which documents are being asked for approval and which are illustrative? So for the public to see that as well. Yes, I, th I think, and well, anything we, that's submitted we will, re, will... We will restate that. Yes, um, and I think it's a bit, well, it's a, it's a good point because it's a bit more nuanced than that because um, if the design codes document is for approval, within that, there's a fair bit of wriggle room, isn't there, in mm -hmm. terms of the, uh, the sentence I read out because you've got mandatory codes, but that sentence right at the outset says, but... Um, you know, you can have a good reason for departing from them. And not so. just the documents, but actually the references and links into other documents. That's what yes. I'm saying. Thanks. For that. So, please, if you could help me make some sense of it, that would be useful. Mr McCarthy, you want to come back? We're going to have a break very shortly, so if you could keep it brief. Um, the, the issue of public consultation... You know, it said that we've got a report that says there's public consultation. But you can't just say, we had consultation, but we didn't have any information. They didn't know what they were approving. They didn't know. And so I wanted to bring this down. This is a public inquiry. So that if we've got leading professionals on both sides uh, and the inspector is not clear, well, we haven't had any public consultation because we're not what we've been consulted on. I mean, so let's, can we also make it real? And the next real issue is, and if it could be taken into consideration, is this a fair and consistent planning application that any member of the public would make? Okay, so would they accept somebody submitting a planning application to build in a field? I'm not telling you what it looks like, I'm not telling you, but it's something like this. I mean, they would be laughed at and thrown out. Go away and do your job properly. So, I'm now focusing back on the EIA, and everybody's talking about the lawyers, and the, the EIA was never meant for lawyers. It came from the United Nations. It came from WHO, World Health Organization. And all it was saying is, please, if you're going to do a development, don't harm people when you don't have to, when you don't have to. And how do you do that is that you ask the applicant, and this is remembering 
an independent, an EIA assessor is independent. Whereas this in this application, I don't think they're here, are they? The, the environmental impact assessor from the, the applicant? I don't, I can see why. Because they're also employed to do the Horizon project. And those same engineers contaminated our water. And they're responsible for this EIA. But don't worry, those consultants are registered by IEMA as merit consultants. And I've spoken to the IEMA and said they're not complying because I've done EIAs, significantly more complicated than this one. There isn't enough information for me to assess it and independently talk to the members of the public and say, you're going to be harmed or not harmed. There isn't the information. So I want to try and make this more public inquiry more real. So the question I have is it's clear. Somebody's misleading here. They are misleading them. They're misleading us. The question under Jersey law, have they deliberately misled them and us? Because that's a criminal offence with up to two years in prison. And I believe <coughs> that the information that we just covered and we've overheard just furthers the case. With, with day one of the public inquiry, we don't know what we're inquiring about. But did they deliberately actually uh, misinform? Because, and the next thing is the EIA falls into another law because that's international law. We also talk about, uh, sorry to bring it back, but environmental social governance that this developer promotes are the best international. This is going to harm Jersey's reputation on environmental social governance. Why would I risk investing my money through Jersey where they can't even look after their own people with their own land? So the question I have, well, statement I'm going to make now, if this team know what they're doing, they should be sacked by those by this islanders. Now, on the other hand, if they don't know what they're doing, which may be quite possible, of course, they should be sacked anyway. So my view is, before, fine, we'll go through the, 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 the few days, this I'm presenting, should Jersey Development Company Board of Directors, who have, in my view, in a, certainly on the planning application and certainly on the EIA, to protect the islanders from harm, have they deliberately misled the public? And if so, under Jersey law, the chief officer of planning, which we don't have one anymore still, can start proceedings to take legal action. And that's what I hope will come out of this inquiry. Thank you. OK, Mr. Cotton, thank you. Very brief. You can, very briefly. This is about the outline application. Yeah, OK. Um, kind of spin a morning of objectivity, which is good. And just because who I am, where I am, how old I am, my experience is a little bit of subjectivity, OK? This whole setup reminds me of holiday I had once in Guernsey with my family. And I got lost in my hire car going to the airport. And I wound the window down and asked uh, a local, where's the airport? And what did he say? You're starting from the wrong place, which is what this is all about. And there's a precedent, and there's a good precedent for Webb, who did first, the first phase of this environment. I was on that team, and everybody, even though it was criticized, at the time, accepted, now accepts that scheme. Uh, I think it all began for me maybe 30, maybe 50 years ago, but in 1988, the island plan uh, was issued, and there was no waterfront then, but La Colette scheme emerged, and it's probably the best scheme that Jersey never had, has never had. Um, 
The planning application for La Collette was never processed. I then began, I can't mention their names, but it were David Arden and Larry Peter Thorne. They drew a line, uh, which, was, which is the uh, current uh, water, uh, waterman, waterfront um, reclamation. And for the next 10 years, they filled it with rubbish, it's contaminated. As the architect with the late great also, we did the first building, which was La Frigate, which is now listed. And uh, as far as um, Sodge DC are concerned, it can't be moved, okay? Listing grade two means the building stays on the site. Um, we built a concrete foundation, 30 meters long, three meters by three meters square, uh, because of the contamination of that site. And we've seen the planners um, object to this thing. We've seen um, John Young object to it, and <coughs> Chris uh, McCarthy objecting to it. And I object to it, because over those past 30 years, I've tried to, because I teach, I've tried to take students, members of my staff, politicians, to good places in, in Europe. And in no particular order, it's Charm 5, Copenhagen, Hammersby in Sweden, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, uh, and Malmo, and best of the lot, uh, Vienna. And I've brought those um, thoughts and experience back to Jersey. I see no evidence whatsoever that Sodge DC even know about these places, uh, let alone be there. And um, they've moved, they've morphed from a feasibility study uh, to a, plan, a, a kind of planning application by stealth, little by little. Um, and they've really missed the boat. As a feasibility study, uh, like uh, Freddie Cohen set up and uh, Duhamel set up, the road was the problem. These people have ignored the road. We still have a six road, six lane motorway through the, through the middle of a so-called housing scheme. And if you talk to people like uh, Sir Mark Boliat, who thinks a 1.7 million pound flat on the top of Horizon solves Jersey's housing problems. It doesn't, it makes them worse. Um, that team, uh, Lee's team, includes ACOM, and within ACOM, ACOM probably got 3,000 architects, one of the biggest in the world, but it includes EDO, and EDO did a fantastic job uh, in Jersey to get the phase one of Waterfront underway. Um, and EDO, I don't know if you've come across them, but they were responsible for the 90, sorry, 2012 London Olympics, which is superb. Um, and Sodge DC should have totally ignored the original web team, and I'm probably the only one remaining from that, but they should have, should have talked to them. Edo should have been involved in this. Um, they are part of ACOM. Edo, uh, 60s formed in uh, San Francisco, mistakenly called eight days a week. Um, I don't know their status now, but they're, they're kind of world class, you know. Jersey's got a world-class finance center, so we need world-class consultants. We haven't got them. Um, I've got nothing more to say except in terms of architecture. I, I as a practicing Jersey architect, would be embarrassed by that presentation. Um, it's a, a ghost village, ghost, ghost town. It's a new word. It's a new word in the system called get us ghettoization, which are gated communities with um, wind tunnel streets, you know, a nightmare place to live, in my opinion. I'll say no more. Thank you, Mr. Mason. <clears throat> okay, I think we'll take a, a short break now till midday. When we resume, we'll finish off um, session one and make a start on session two. Okay, thank you.
get going again. Yeah. Um, right, just to recap on where, where we are in session one. We've uh, been through my introduction, opening statements, digital model, procedural matters, including all of that <laughs> complicated business around the, the outline application. Um, I'm going to move on now to a couple of items which I intend to actually make very brief. Um, the next item is on the relevant bridging island plan policies, supplementary planning guidance, emerging guidance and other guidance. Now, I'd like to do this in an inquiry hearing just to make sure that um, I'm looking at the correct list of um, plans, policies and documents. Now, this has been assisted by the statement of common ground that uh, has been produced by the applicant and the planning authority. And I don't need to go through the weft and weave of every policy, but I, I ran through the schedule of documents and policies that were listed in that, and it pretty much uh, matched my own assessment. So um, let me just um, turn to that and find it. So in the statement of common ground, there is um, a list of relevant policies. I won't go through them because there are too many. Uh, it covers two pages. Um, and then there is a whole list with hyperlinks of uh, various guidance documents. Um, including draft guidance. Uh, there are three draft supplementary planning guidance documents, one of which I hadn't actually picked up until I saw this, which was the residential standards document. That seemed to slip through my net, but I've, I've now got a copy. So I'm happy to just take all that as read, and we, we will, of course, uh, touch on relevant policies as we go through the session. So is there anything anybody wants to say on on that. I, I hope that's all clear for everyone. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Can I um, give a very quick update on the uh, time frame for the emerging guidance? Okay, As thank you. you. Say, we've got three strands of emergent uh, guidance, one relating to parking standards, uh, one related to residential density, and one related to minimum standards in new residential developments. Uh, we've been directed to prioritise the SPG relating to density. Um, that's our priority for the next couple of weeks. Hopefully we'll get a, um, uh, an, a sign off on that SPG by the end of May. Uh, the two other um, emerging SPGs, parking and the um, minimum standards, we're looking at probably sometime in June, hopefully for sign off on that. We've been to consultation on each of the SPGs. Consultation's now finished. We've reviewed feedback, and we're in a position to pass them on to the minister as soon as we can. So next couple of weeks, we're looking at the density SPG, and then sometime in June, the parking and minimum standards. And on the parking issue, I would ask you to regard the extant parking standards SPG as a, a mere <coughs> optical illusion. Um, it's a pretty uh, pretty much outdated SPG and we'd rather not um, hold any decisions on that SPG. I have said that on many occasions. Good, they keep good, cropping good. up though, don't they? Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> time we rescinded it. It's just a, a matter of um, uh, resource to get that actually formally rescinded. But the, the new parking SPG will automatically then rescind that. So just treat that one as just um, a, an optical illusion. OK. Um, right. Could I just ask then, on that, on those three SPG documents which are heading towards yeah. uh, formal adoption, yeah. um, as a result of... I don't want to go into the detail of it, but as a result of consultation exercises... Yeah. Is there going to be much change to any of those? We're not envisaging any significant change. Um, 
the feedback we've received has been pretty positive in terms of what was drafted. Um, they clearly state the direction the minister wishes to travel um, in terms of making new homes a better standard, in terms of turning the parking standards on the head. So in town, we're looking at um, achieving maximum standards rather than minimum standards of parking. Uh, and density, it's all a case of maximizing um, the use of sites without detriment to um, um, the quality of life on those sites. But we're expecting them all to be approved largely as they are. There might be some relatively minor amendment. And the the mechanics of adoption, is that a ministerial decision? It's a ministerial decision, right. yeah. So it's likely that by the time the determining panel sits to discuss my report, these SPGs will be adopted and... We would expect that, yes. Yeah. OK, thank you. Whilst you're there, Ms Coates, so a question I have. Um, it came up in another planning here, and I'll ask, ask the question here. The, the Urban Character Appraisal Review 2021, yeah. which was a, a BIP evidence document, is not adopted as SPG, is it? I believe it is adopted, Tracy. The, the Shooker. Sorry, Tent Urban Character Appraisal. The reason that an SPG is adopted is for itself. Yeah, so the document is tied to the SPG. The SPG, there is one in force, um, but the um, the document itself is, is the evidence behind that document, I believe. Is that right? I believe that's incorrect. So right. The uh, proposal to adopt part of the urban character appraisal is tied in with the density SPG, which is not yet adopted. Right. Well, that was my understanding, actually. Yeah, well, that, 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 that might be the case. It's not a, um, a direct line of work I've been involved with, so that might be the case, but I can confirm that today. It would be... Mr Nicholson, remind me, because I, I know you're up to speed on this. The earlier urban character appraisal was that adopted as SPG? Yes, sir. That is, the, that is adopted and remains adopted. Uh, it's now called the St. Helier Design Guide. Yes, yes. So there isn't an update. Well, yes, I'll, I'll stand, stand corrected on that one, but we have got the new um, character appraisal in and we are working to that document. Uh, but again, it's just a case, as Mr Nicholson probably correctly states, that it'll be tied into the um, uh, the emerging guidance that's uh, coming out shortly. Yeah, it's all about calibrating it, weight yeah. and... Pa yeah. Parts of that urban character appraisal are written into the Bridging Island Plan yes. as well. But the guidance section, which, is, which I believe is uh, t tied to the density SPG, is not yet adopted. Yes. OK. Thank you. Oh, sorry, that's that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, now the next item is community engagement. Now I've I've heard some <coughs> remarks from Mr. McCarthy and, and, and others, I think, on their views on consultation, but there is whether they agree with it or not. There has been. Uh, community consultation and that is set out in a document and also it's core document 3.2 and also there is proof of evidence from Philippa Curran on that subject I don't think she's actually attending is she I think it's uh, just a, correct, a, a written proof and also in the statement of common ground um, I believe that the planning authority accepts that there is compliance with policies at GD2. GD2, yes, sir. Um, so, I mean, I will report that to the minister, but I'll also report views. It, it, it's not uncommon <laughs> with community consultation for those, uh, you know, interested parties to say, well, it should have been done in a different way, it should have been more inclusive, but... Um, 
I've, I've got the submitted document and uh, there's nothing there that suggests that the policy is not complied with. So, Mr McCarthy. The, sorry to have to repeat, but the environmental impact assessment scoping document was submitted by the applicant. There was no comment made. It doesn't mean it was approved. And there's been no public consultation on the environmental impact of this development uh, for its excavation of, of hazardous material and the building massing. Um, thank you. So if I might just clarify, the, the whole process around the application involves that consultation. Mr McCarthy, I don't want to put words into his mouth, he must be well aware of it because he's here today providing his view on it as well, sir. Today is part of the community consultation, which was launched back in uh, 2020, autumn of 2020, and, and it remains open all the way through to the determination of the application, sir. I would also just add to that that the environmental impact assessment or the environmental impact statement was part of the package of application documents that were put in the public domain as part of the public, the general public consultation that planning undertakes. So it, it has been available for the public to access and review. Okay. Briefly, yeah. Well, it's a critical aspect of preparing an environmental impact <coughs> assessment in accordance with international best practice, which is a part of the environmental social governance, um, is the scoping. Sitting down with people and saying, what are your concerns? What do you want to address? Do you want to, uh, look, should we dig up this hazardous waste or should we not? And if, you, if we are, what do we need to do? What assessments do we need to do to uh, reassure you in doing such? Uh, dangerous work will be satisfactory to you. So it's the scoping I'm stressing. There's been none, and there was no uh, comment from the planning department on the scoping opinion. So, they, so the applicant has proceeded without uh, an agreed scoping opinion for their EIA. Okay. So just in, sorry, just in, in response to that, um, under the EIA order, there is no mandatory requirement for scoping to be subject to public consultation in Jersey. Um, and there's also no requirement for the local authority to respond to a request for, um, a, to a scoping opinion. Um, ideally, it's best practice that a, an authority would come back and confirm and clarify the scope and environmental impact assessment. Um, but it, it, this wasn't done in this case. Okay. Mr. Young. Uh, but having had some experience of environmental impact assessments in planning matters, I think it's always an issue. It is absolutely right that our law on uh, our regulations on um, environmental impact in Jersey are relatively uh, limited compared with the UK. Um, but no doubt about it, I think that it a judgment will need to be made on the content of any environmental impact assessment as to whether or not it does accord with best practice generally in terms of uh, making a value judgment on that because it is a mandatory statement and uh, when, when we see the list of what matters are going to be uh, approved uh, with the note that's being done I expect to see the environmental impact assessment somewhere referred on it um, I think there always is an issue though that um, earlier on if I heard it correctly it was said that we were going to get a, a statement of common ground agreed by, on, on environmental regulation I didn't quite pick that up because that, as we have separation between, in, in Jersey, between the environmental team who manage the regulation under waste laws uh, and contaminated land, whereas the planning department uh, sits separately within the government organization. And so that, seeing that statement is, is quite important from our regulator, because it's highly material to the question of what is being done legally and what is being done without that consent, those consents in place at the moment. And I'd like to get clarity on that. Um, I, perhaps, you know, sometime we could learn, I couldn't see that document, the, the Statement of Common Ground on Regulatory, Environmental Regulation uh, on, on, on the state's website. And Mr. Nicholson said it was up to date, but I couldn't see it. So I would personally like to see clarity of that. We'll, we'll, um, 
we'll have a look at that. But this is an important issue, I think. It's not yes. a, a, a minor matter. And it's, it's something we'll pick up on Thursday. Uh, okay, right. Right, let's um, draw session one to a close. Let me just take some soundings from the applicants to Mr Nicholson and Mr, Mr. Henry. Um, we've got now uh, session two, which is going to look at the master plan, urban design, townscape and visual impact. And you've got a, a number of uh, witnesses. Um, as I said in my, my open, I do want to manage the time. I don't want, at the same time, I don't want to rush the, uh, those issues. Uh, I, it got me thinking that working backwards, um, we've got session three this afternoon on the historic environment. I'm pretty well versed in that because I've read the proofs of evidence. I think I understand the issues, but I would like to have at least an hour on uh, session three. So kind of working back, so it means we need to conclude session two by, shall we say, quarter to four, um, allowing for a, a break somewhere along the way. Um, I've been given no sort of prior notices of how you want to present your witnesses and uh, whether you're going to use uh, the screens. Um, can you just run me through it? Um, so, unfortunately, it was only um, on close of play yesterday that we realised that this would be the um, kind of mechanism that we would be preventing, uh, presenting evidence. <coughs> um, I've got any limited contact with um, uh, Patrick, who is our uh, witness for the um, uh, second session. Uh, we've got the, the team here on architectural matters. Uh, I've just been informed uh, approximately 10 minutes uh, from each of the, the, the witnesses. Yeah. Um, I think Patrick is uh, available on Teams. Uh, I just wanted to uh, point out as well, the, the reason that we shuffled the uh, programme round uh, was to uh, fit historic environment in at the end of the day, you know, politely uh, fit it in uh, without diminishing its status because the, uh, the topics do have some synergy with, with Townsend's yeah. visual impact. And indeed, the um, witness for the planning authority is the same for all, all those topics. So I align with your thinking that we may be able to uh, flow seamlessly into historic environment towards the end of the day um, on the basis that uh, many of the topics will be common with session two. So uh, no more than 10 minutes uh, from each of our uh, witnesses uh, across um, master planning, urban design, uh, townscape and uh, the approach to the design codes as well. Okay. And planning authority, how are you going to approach this issue? Um, it will be myself and Tracy Ingle who will just um, give some feedback in terms of our position. Okay. Um, in terms of the length of time, probably 10, 10 minutes for myself. Probably similar for Tracy. Okay. Um, well, Mr. Nicholson, Mr. Henry, I mean, uh, did, did you say that there were some logistical issues? I, mean, uh, I hope that we are covered, but um, Gillespie's our um, lead on the master planning um, elements, uh, the urban designers, uh, landscape architects. Uh, unfortunately, we've got no representation in the room from Gillespie's. Uh, they were coming from three different airports yesterday. All three flights uh, returned uh, because of the fog and um, they are unable to rebook uh, for today. So all three witnesses are uh, uh, on uh, appearing virtually. That's the extent of the uh, logistical yeah. issues. Sir. So we can't communicate very easily with them. Uh, I understand Delta have got them ready to go. But they, they are actually ready to go. They are ready right. to go. And how do you want to... Do you want to do one, then take questions, and then on to, on to the, the, the next, or do you, want, do you want to run the witnesses one, one after another? Um, I will just take a sounding on that uh, with the people who are in the room. Okay, we, we will uh, run together. I think it is, uh, I think the running order is um, Patrick Conn from Gillespie's, then uh, uh, John Fielding and Mike Waddington, 
uh, to be followed by uh, Sarah Gibson in relation to uh, TVIA following the um, sequence in the, uh, in the, in the programme. So if the timings run to plan, uh, it's probably half an hour across uh, all three witnesses. So. Okay, sorry, who was it on the TVIA stuff? That was uh, Sarah, Gibson Sarah Gibson from uh, Gillespie's, who, who I understand is available online. Okay, okay. Well, uh, the the floor is yours. Um, Thank you, uh, Delta. If we could please get Patrick up. Uh, good afternoon, Patrick, uh, from uh, hotel room in Gatwick, I believe. Now. Yes. Good afternoon, right. sir. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I'm I'm getting very bad feedback. Um, I think somebody might need to mute at that end. Can you can you hear me? Okay. We we can hear you. Great. Thanks. Um, first of all, yeah, apologies for not being able to join in person this morning. Um, I'm booked on the the earliest possible flight, so I will hopefully, weather permitting, be there tomorrow morning. Um, so my name is Patrick Conn. I'm a chartered landscape architect. Um, I've been practicing for 10 years and I'm an associate at Gillespie's. Uh, I'm joined also by my colleague George Mann, who is going to be assisting in, in sharing any um, visual information that we need to bring up on screen. Um, and as John's mentioned, Sarah Gibson, who has undertaken the TVIA, uh, is also online and ready to um, provide an introduction to her work. Um, so Following the, the original design competition, Gillespie's were appointed by the JDC in 2020 as landscape and urban design consultants and framework lead for the Southwest St. Helier Waterfront Framework. Um, we worked to develop the scheme for the original outline application in late 2021. Uh, my own involvement began in early 2022 during the addendum period as we continued our engagement with uh, Government of Jersey and other stakeholders post submission and sought to work through outstanding concerns ahead of this inquiry uh, and this culminated in the January 2023 addendum scheme submission. Um, I wanted first to say a little bit about the overall approach and in particular the idea of a landscape-led framework. Um, the Southwestern Helia Planning Framework SPG promotes a people first building second approach to the waterfront proposals and this has underpinned the uh, landscape-led approach that's been taken in developing the design. Um, so this has meant developing the framework plan and outline massing um, shaped by placemaking and public realm uh, with spaces between buildings being considered from the outset. Um, so it's creation of activated characterful outdoor spaces um, that's driven the layout rather than being a an afterthought within sort of leftover space between buildings. Uh, connectivity has also been key in terms of how this framework can stitch the development into its surroundings. Uh, but also to deliver wider benefits in terms of connecting the waterfront to the town centre. Um, as, as with the architectural design, uh, there is a need to maintain flexibility and to allow the scheme to evolve as each plot fo comes forward. However, the landscape led approach is something that is embedded in the parameter plans, which define at high level the, the form and the scale of those external spaces. Uh, and as we've already talked about to to an extent, the requirements for the delivery of landscape led vision is then set out within the for approval design code summary document. Uh, and that contains and in fact leads with a very comprehensive set of landscape codes um, and these set out requirements for uh, site wide strategies in relation to things like tree planting, soil depths, biodiversity, materials. They also provide detailed requirements for each landscape space within the plan including things like path widths, play space, specific uses and character. Uh, and the codes include that mix of mandatory requirements, which are, are more absolute, and the advisory codes, which allow some more flexibility for evolution at the detailed design stage. And combined, those form the basis against which future RMAs will be considered, um, each of which would be subject to further public consultation and engagement. And as, as has already been mentioned, it's my understanding that any divergence from those codes, if they were approved, would require justification um, and agreement with the planning authority at the, the RMA stage um, and be subject to further, further consultation. Uh, in terms of our brief, um, besides the overarching policies of the Bridging Island Plan, um, two key documents that have underpinned the approach to the site from the outset 
um, are the Southwest St Helia Planning Framework SPG and the St Helia Urban Character Appraisal. Uh, now the SPG complements the Bridging Island Plan and provides more detailed information and guidance on the development of the waterfront area. Uh, and it includes a series of general principles which have been drawn from community consultation and effectively set out the key requirements and expectations for the scheme. So those have been our continual reference for us um, in developing the design. Um, the first of these relates to circulation and connectivity. Um, healing the severance of the waterfront from the town centre is a key aim of the SPG. And the scheme's massing has been shaped by this uh, main pedestrian axis that spans across the Rue de la Liberation and links the waterfront to the town centre. Uh, other pedestrian cycle routes are also enhanced, particularly along Rue de la Liberation, where wider circulation routes and de-engineering of the road with planting and new trees um, provide significant improvements to the existing hostile condition. Uh, besides the existing vehicular routes on Rue de Liberation and Rue de Luteau and the Esplanade, much of the ground floor public realm is to be pedestrianised um, to provide a much more people-centric new neighbourhood. Um, new public open space for residents and the wider population was a key expectation within the SPG and the proposals include a sequence of new civic squares along the main pedestrian axis and activated by surrounding building uses to help draw people to the new waterfront. Uh, the Jardin de la Mer are retained and significantly expanded and enhanced, including new Lido and Play Hub. Uh, the Marina Gardens is also enhanced with new planting, pavilion and play hub. And there are a series of smaller courtyard gardens and roof terraces throughout the scheme for, for residents. Uh, in terms of uses, the scheme provides nearly a thousand new residential units on, on brownfield land in a highly sustainable town centre location um, in order to address key policy aims and significant public need. Um, however, in line with the SPG, it also recognises the need to create a vibrant, active mix of uses. Um, the removal of vehicle access, um, plant, storage and other inactive uses to the basement has allowed much of the ground floor to be activated with new leisure, community and arts facilities, restaurants, shops and social infrastructure. And these are focused around those new civic spaces, uh, which are also designed to support pop up uses such as markets and cultural events. Um, the SPG and the character appraisal stress the need to consider the existing urban grain and character of St Helier whilst acknowledging that Waterfront is a distinct neighbourhood in its own right, with its own emerging modern character. And as such, the development of massing and the scale of spaces has been influenced by an analysis of the existing town grain, and there's some discussion on that within the DAS. Uh, consideration of the findings of the character appraisal have also informed the approach to the architectural codes, um, with the aim of shaping an approach that responds to the town's existing character my colleagues um, John Fielding and Mike Waddington will say a bit more about that later. Uh, in terms of height, the character appraisal supports buildings up to eight storeys high within the waterfront um, and massing heights have been developed in line with this and with consideration for the surrounding context um, in terms of the heights on the proposed parkside and commercial quarters. Those respond to the existing esplanade and the IFC, which range from four to nine storeys in height. Heights on the waterfront step down to the six storey datum established by the Radisson Hotel. And to the south, the horizon blocks range from nine to 11 storeys, and the development sits below this at the maximum of eight storeys. Um, these heights are, of course, a significant change to the existing condition on site and will inevitably result in some change to views within and into and out of the site. Uh, in line with um, general principle six of the SPG, the impact on views has been a consideration in the development of the massing and a TVIA has been prepared in order to set out those impacts for consideration in the planning balance. My colleague Sarah Gibson will say more about that later. Um, it's important to note that the character appraisal identifies the waterfront as having a uh, low sensitivity to change and also comments on its capacity to act as a safety valve to accommodate forms of development that might be too damaging elsewhere. Besides these policies and guidance documents, another key requirement that shaped our approach has been the need to increase the height of the seawall for flood defence. And that's something that's been incorporated into the proposals in order to minimise the impact on the relationship with the sea um, and to make the most of the associated opportunities to expand and enhance the Jardin de la Mer. And this is a key piece of public infrastructure that will be funded and delivered by the proposals. In terms of the design evolution, taking the SPG and the character appraisal as a starting point, the design has 
evolved over the last three years. Um, and that's really been an iterative process with engagement with the government of Jersey departments, other stakeholders, um, community consultation, including three rounds of engagement, each with numerous events and extensive peer review. We've had a total of seven uh, Jersey Architecture Commission reviews and also the appointment of Mike Waddington Associates to act as a critical friend in reviewing and rethinking some elements of the codes. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail on that design evolution. There's a description of it within my proof and uh, and in DAS as well. Um, I mean, this feedback has influenced the design in numerous ways, and it's resulted in a scheme which we feel balances the, the optimization of the site for the delivery of homes with sensitivity to its context, the needs of the community and the environment, and at the same time delivers multiple benefits in terms of connectivity, low carbon transport, sea defense, climate resilience, biodiversity, urban greening, um, new public realm and green space, new play space, leisure facilities, arts, community and social infrastructure. Um, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues John Fielding from Heta Architects and Mike Waddington from Mike Waddington Associates to talk a bit now about their role in developing the architectural codes. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Fielding, um, 25 years of experience as an architect um, in the UK delivering uh, complex planning and stakeholder and heritage projects. Um, we're working prim primarily with Gillespie's from 2020 on the master plan proposals as collaboration, but also focus for us on evolution of the architecture, design code elements and visioning framework outline um, submission. I'll just give a little bit of context as to why myself and Mike um, are here. Um, so the codes have been carefully evolved since the start of a, an extensive consultation process dating back to 2020, right through to the original submission in December 2021. Uh, and subsequently to that, we collaborated with uh, Waddington Architects based in Jersey to contribute peer review and aspects of Ireland architectural perspective to help inform the codes further for the subsequent addendum, which was in January 2021. I'll let Mike introduce himself. Thank you. My name is Mike Waddington. Um, I spent 10 years working in London and uh, the last 26 years working in Jersey. Um, I was asked to join the team to provide um, a peer review and concept redesign inputs around the parkside facades and the waterfront square facades, but also the G1 gateway building, which we uh, reduced in height and now refer to as the apex building. Uh, and my particular emphasis really was on trying to, to sort of deliver um, local relevance, emphasising local relevance in the design codes and the design approaches for the elements I was involved in. Thanks, Mike. Um, just to start with, the purpose of the design codes in, in our respect, there's been a lot of conversation earlier to this meeting, uh, to this session, but to define high-level principles for the consistency and approach of architectural form and character of the individual buildings to evolve out of whilst respecting the overall master plan vision framework, local policy guidance and context in order to deliver the vision in, in, in a little granular detail at later reserved matters stage. Um, the code and parameter plans seek to maintain the right balance between securing the aspirations of the development and maintaining sufficient flexibility for the scheme to evolve to later reserved matters stage to remain relevant and appropriate to context and policy. Um, as I mentioned, there's been an extensive consultation and stakeholder engagement process that has informed the codes themselves. Um, in pre-planning and also with statutory, non-statutory neighbours and local community um, engagement. Um, in reference to how the codes relate to policy, obviously there's the Bridging Island Plan and SPG that relates to that in the framework. But one of the fundamental documents was our review of the Shuka document 2021, which was the urban character appraisal and the relationship that heavily that did influence quite heavily um, the design codes for each plot within the revision framework proposals, and they can be seen in detail in section six of the design codes document. Also, there is a lessons learned summary of that in um, the DAS section 2.5, and how that relates to the urban character appraisal. Um, essentially, this links back to retaining and enhancing the character of St. Helier described in the Bridging Island Plan, and the context of that to the SPG supplementary framework. So these policies have, have heavily helped us develop these, these codes. Um, and essentially, 
this was in, approach, in response to some of the consultation comments about an approach to architecture that had been developed as part of that alongside the urban character appraisal. In, a, in essence, to define aspects such as principles, architectural typologies, a kit of parts, matrix of architectural elements to use within each typology. We're potentially touching on materials, colour palette, texture and tone. Um, briefly, the evolution of these, these codes as they've developed. Um, they're, they're defined in certain aspects by frontages, entrances and lobbies, colonnades, proximity and overlooking, facades, general proportions, balconies and overhangs, residential quality, privacy and overlooking, roof level datums and set, setbacks, approach to rooftop plant, green biodiversity roofs, aspects of wind mitigation and other architectural elements. Um, and as has been mentioned earlier, some of the document is submitted as for mandatory and some as guidelines. Uh, the individual building plots are des described in terms of, of layered characteristics in grain and level and were in fact simplified following um, comments after the first outline submission in December 2021. And that has been incorporated, that simplification has been incorporated into um, the addendum submission in January 2023. Those key amendments can be summarised um, before I introduced Mike on, on his aspects. Um, that a number of the grain of the facade grids that were um, seen in the codes were simplified or reduced. Um, the codes for A1 building frontage on the main square uh, were simplified and more symmetry um, given to those aspects in response to planners' comments. There was an extensive review of the design codes related to the massing amendments in relation to clarifications of all buildings sitting under the eight-storey um, permitted envelope, which included uh, aspects of roof plant and uh, adding green roofs to most of the um, buildings. In addition to that, um, there was um, full architectural peer review, which I'll now hand over to Mike to go. Thank you, John. Uh, so in my proof, you'll notice that I mainly concentrated on the outcomes of the areas of work I was scoped out to do. Uh, if I may, I'd like to briefly run through um, the design thinking that underpinned that work. Because on face value, design codes don't sound particularly interesting, but I'd like to talk about the, the passion and the effort that went into them. I think there's also an understandable leap of faith or element of trust with outline planning applications. Will the codes deliver something really special? Will they deliver the promise of delight? I'd like to try and convince you that they will and outline the reasons why. Um, I channeled my design thinking through two key topic areas. Firstly, identity and well-being, and secondly, memory and movement. Um, and in terms of identity, uh, initially I looked at the personalities of the facades of the Parkside and Waterfront Square elevation um, buildings and also the Apex building. As in my proof, the Parkside is a calmer, more formal backdrop to the park, um, more vertically emphasised in terms of its composition, rather like the language of St Helier that, it, that backdrops it. However, the Waterfront Square is more light-hearted and is aimed to evoke a sense of fun more horizontally emphasised in composition as it addresses the sea and the horizon. The apex building is more ex expressive architecturally, but in its form, it's quite modest um, it, as a sort of subtractive corner stepping down in height. It borrows from the dynamics of the triangular site it sits on. Also, in terms of identity, trying to sort of look for contextual clues that might uh, spark design responses Capturing the essence of the site, the, its unique sense of place, what's special about the area, or particular, or even ordinary, and how might this be translated into design responses. The whole site is effectively transitional between townscape and portscape, and so it has got the capacity, I, th I thought, to be a conduit in terms of um, permeability. The Apex building aims to sort of create a contextual connection or conversation with the port. Um, Shelter, exposure, trigger colonnades, canopies, roof gardens, and private balconies. The feel and smell of being near the sea suggests mar maritime landscape places. In terms of well-being, the landscape-led framework with green roofs, trees, and biodiversity help hugely with well-being. In addition to that, um, with the apex building, uh, social circulation spaces 
and common areas help to encourage neighbourliness. Dual and triple aspect homes with tall ceilings uh, for great daylight and fresh air. Um, and shared spaces uh, like the podium gardens and roof gardens, and also the possibility of the ground floor having social activities too in the form of work cafes, gyms or laundrettes. And creating identity at macro scale in the public realm, but also at micro scale with small details, the potential for miniature public art installations. In terms of memory and movement, it seemed to me that memory could be a useful device to create identity, particularly in new places and in a powerful way. The memory of disappearing maritime industrial heritage, cranes, gantries, silos, and railway tracks, triggering the apex building's steel exoskeleton, and the harbour-related colour scheme. The memory of local history, past eras, and past industries like Jersey's brick-making industry influencing material choices. Jersey's 19th century knitting industry influencing sculptural metalwork and railings. Whole families living knitting 24-7 and men being threatened with prison if they did so during the harvest. Such was the wealth it generated. Jersey's oyster influence in industry influencing landscape gabions and walls, with our oysters feeding the poor of London. The heritage of land reclamation, earlier seawalls, now land-bound. The heritage of the evolving harbours and how our changes are part of the same ev evolution. And recent memory, which could be celebrated by integrating salvage from the site into facades and the new places, how walls might offer narratives of the past or even the future. Memory as public art, enriching placemaking led design responses and narrative. Movement, literally in terms of colonnades that connect through up parts of the projects I was involved with, linking the port to the town. Gordon Cullen's here and there, the joy of connecting places and being intrigued about what's around the corner how the floor and the pathways as canvases can enrich people's lives through wider storytelling. Links across the road and the potential to embrace the Coronation Way initiative, which is an initiative looking to connect pedestrian routes and cycle routes across town. And the movement of water, the ebb and flow of the tides. The movement in the facades we are suggesting is achieved through a, a layering of different materials and textures and colors creating new connections and maximizing pedestrian permeability and movement and access for all. So just a few last thoughts. Um, the ideas and process described have really infused the design codes and the access statement with compelling and locally relevant, even vernacular ingredients, capable of delivering exemplar buildings and places which will be rooted in their context. The waterfront is an opportunity to create a wonderful new quarter connecting the town to the port beautifully designed and shaped through community engagement and expectations. Inspired by a deep understanding of the sense of place of our site surroundings, the vision framework provides, I think, a really exciting template for this part of St. Helia's evolution and offers the promise of a really special new place for everyone to enjoy. Thank you. Could I, could I just finally summarize that one aspect since day one with Gillespie's in defining the master plan strategy as being a landscape-led approach was in terms of SBG guidance on trying to visually conceive, conceal vehicles as much as possible. The below ground parking strategy was fundamental to creating green streets, pedestrian-led, safe, healthy and active street frontages and being able to conceal parking as much as possible uh, was a key fundamental part of the landscape-led master plan approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from your own side? No, I think uh, if it's okay with you, so we uh, can well, either roll straight into TVIA or we can uh, pause for questions from the Master Planning and Architectural team. I think given the time, quarter to one, it'd probably be best if we take questions and the, the TVIA, I suspect, is going to be... Uh, bit more involved and need, needs a bit of time so if we, if we do the questions on what, what we've heard so far uh, then we'll take the lunch break and uh, we'll start the TV at uh, two o'clock so um, let me just uh, turn to the planning authority then in terms of what you've heard from uh, the three witnesses uh, one online and uh, two gentlemen here uh, would you like to say <laughs> 
Um, in terms of questions, I don't have any questions based on the, the information that's been provided in the presentations. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to go to... Uh, should we... No. Okay. Uh, Ms. Mr. Young. Uh, I, I listened carefully. I think uh, I can see the, um, I was impressed with the words leap of faith, as it were, is that the intention in this application is to, with this outline app approach, is to, there's a leap of faith that we will actually achieve uh, what was mentioned, i.e. Um, these green, the mix of the, the balance, the green spaces, the um, pedestrian priority and so on, all of that I think does come across in the SPG or at least in, and I, workshop as I intended people that but I think what the question in my mind is the relative balance between the um, degree of massing of buildings particularly building heights and the spaces in between them particularly in the residential area and I think I picked up a comment I think one of the um, one of the presentations said is that the they drew upon drew upon um, drew upon uh, measurements or based on existing St. Helia, existing St. Helia. And um, what puzzled me is that, generally speaking, I think you, in the streets of St. Helia, one doesn't see um, building heights of that sort of level, generally, of up to eight stories. And I think the one, the key thing for me is the relationship between the width of the, what is the road in town, but here will be a pedestrian walkway, and, and the heights of buildings. Uh, and a moment when you walk around St. Helier, you get a feeling of being able to see the sky. And my question is, is that what analysis was done of, of you know, what would be, what we, um, what we create then in those wet network of streets, uh, streets uh, with what looked to me a very, very different equation with very tall buildings and very narrow, well, you know, streets, street, um, streets um, widths based on current St. Helier. Because, the, you know, what I would worry about is two things. First of all, the amount of sunlight that people would get at normal times, normal, uh, normal conditions, or say summer conditions, probably. Obviously, in winter, it's very different. Uh, and also the wind tunnel effect, because this is a very, very exposed site. Uh, exposed to southwesterly gales in the winter time, it is known to be a problem. And, of course, um, whilst we all want to see vegetation and natural growth, uh, I, I would certainly would be looking to find out what the information is about the, the landscaping planting that's going to be possible in such a, um, what is basically a hostile environment with wind and salt laden wind uh, and so on. I'd like to hear that. And so the, uh, where that all leads to is whether or not the balance, which I think the word was spoken of, whether the balance between um, development uh, and, and, and open space is right, or whether it should be shifted more towards a greater degree of open space. Uh, obviously, I'm not got into the numbers. I couldn't follow that. But I think as a principle, I, 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 I get looking at that video we saw earlier, um, it kind of looked a bit horrific to me. Um, that was the impression that I got. Um, it may well be that always with parameters and no, you know, not having designed features that that's an artificiality. You can certainly improve things, but nonetheless, that is a, a question from me. So I'd like to hear a little bit about that. I was a little bit, I've always raised the question about the arts and community. Um, you know, personally, I've always had, I mentioned it in my submission, but it's probably, it's, it's relevant to the Western side of whether there was space for an indoor um, arts facility here within the waterfront rather than just uh, relying on open space, piazza areas and so on, because those, of course, are very usable in summer. But generally speaking, they are not generally usable in winter conditions. Uh, so I, I'd like to hear more about those things, please. So thank you. That's me personally. Thank you. OK, well, if, if you just want to just hang on a moment, because I'll just uh, ask the uh, applicants, three witnesses, if there's there's anything you'd like to respond on there in terms of what, what you've heard? And if Patrick... Does. I wonder if we could get Patrick back on yeah. Teams, please, for... Um, we, we might need to uh, 
break down uh, Mr. Young's points into a series of questions so that we could follow. Uh, sure. There was, there, were, there was quite a lot there, some of which uh, relates to matters which are later in the week. But um, it, uh, apologies, I'm not the, I'm not the witness. Um, I, I heard the first question about street widths and the um, approach taken by the project team. I wonder if uh, Patrick might run us through the work done and the approach on that, if, if that was where yeah. you wanted to go first? Well, I, I was just uh, giving you an opportunity to respond. I mean, the, the points I uh, picked up from what Mr Young was saying was he, he focused on, uh, latched onto that term, leap of faith. And uh, he, he did mention about... Um, this issue around the relative width of uh, roads and heights of buildings, and he said that as you walk around St Helier, uh, one of the, his observations is you get to see the sky. And uh, I think his question was, uh, are you going to be able to see the sky with this type of de de development as you, as you wander around it? Uh, I think, am I putting words into your mouth? No, no, it's the, it's the feel. It's the feel for it, because that's what this part, I think, is about. Landscaping is about trying to achieve a character. And I think it's a car-free environment. I get that point. Having more planting, that's great. That was one of my questions, whether you can actually get stuff to grow. Because we see lovely trees, but generally lovely trees in Jersey take about at least 12, 15, maybe 20 years to come. Um, but it's, it's, it's that impression created by the relative street width, or at least the walkway width, and the height size of the buildings that are either side of them. And I suppose related to that is the not just the look at the sky and the feel, but also the amount of sunlight that people can access within those spaces, particularly um, in the perhaps in the winter and spring when we've got a sh much shorter day length. Okay. There's, a, there's a lot of overlaps with other yeah, sections. Sure. That I, we're, I'll, we're I'll, I'll leave it to you to shake no, that. We'll, we'll take let, it where you want it to go. Let Mr. Mr. Kong come back. Any, any sort of reactions, you, responses you'd like to make to uh, Mr. Young on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think in terms of this kind of analysis of town grain and how that's related to the massing, um, where that's really come through, I think, is in in defining the kind of length of, of block facades and also in looking at the the kind of push and pull within the massing. So we're very conscious that, you know, we're not creating, we're not recreating um, old St. Helier Town Centre here. This is a new uh, a new character area for the, the town centre. It's a different kind of modern modern character. Um, however, we were keen to kind of reference the the um, the existing town grain in setting those kind of maximum block lengths and in particularly in the way that the maximum extents massing um, creates some push and pull and helps to kind of start to articulate the facades and create something that is a more kind of human scale within what is, um, as, as Mr Young has rightfully pointed out, uh, a um a, a development which is not you know the same height as as the the general heights across town center although it does relate to those kind of surrounding surrounding heights on um the esplanade the afc um horizon um i think uh in terms of the um the scale of the spaces between those um we've the way we've approached that i think really is looking at um at case studies um from you know what, what we view as as uh, exemplar case studies um, in terms of setting street widths and and how the the treatment of those streets creates a more human scale. So I think it's it's partly about proportions and and street widths, um, and it's also about how those are treated in terms of um, incorporating planting and allowing sufficient offsets for uh, pedestrian routes. Um, we've looked at case studies, um, including our own scheme in Elephant Castle, which has been very successful in terms of a, a landscape-led um, pedestrianised uh, scheme um, with very similar kind of street widths. Um, and we've used those to kind of inform the, 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 the offsets between buildings. Um, in terms of this point on, on views of the sky, obviously this is a, 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 um, a taller scale to, to the um, the old St Helier Town Centre. But one thing that we've kind of embedded from the start is to create these kind of uh, views through the development um, in terms of how the massing has been kind of carved up, as it were, to, to create these kind of long vistas, um, particularly along those 
those kind of critical links through across the Rue de Liberation um, and allowing those kind of open views through um, from particularly from the the esplanade through to the waterfront. Um, so that's something that we've kind of been conscious of in in developing the uh, the the extents of the the outline massing. Um, I think the other point was where well, there was the, some points um, on the um, daylight and sunlight and and wind conditions. Um, as has been mentioned, there's a separate session to to look at that in more detail um, later in the week. So I I don't want to necessarily get into that in too much detail now. It's something that has been reviewed by the DEIA consultants as we've developed the um, the massing. It's informed the the shape of, of the blocks, um, in particular, the kind of step down of those perimeter blocks to, to maximize um, sunlight into into spaces. Um, I think we, we, we don't want to get into the technicalities of that, um, given that we have another session to deal with that. Um, the other point was on the, the landscape approach and planting and how we make this successful. I think it's something we're very conscious of. We we work on a lot of kind of quite urban schemes where we're trying to increase urban greening and, and make space for, for proper uh, decent sized trees with broad canopies to be able to succeed. Um, it's something we've done successfully on a number of schemes. And I think the kind of the, the critical factors really are um, providing enough space in terms of the offsets from buildings, providing enough soil volume, um, which is something that's been kind of embedded within the design codes um, and in the, the, uh, the design of the, the, the basement slab um, to allow that sufficient soil volume for, for good sized trees. Um, and then the other factor is, is using the right species, selecting the right species. And that's something that we've We've looked at with, um, we've consulted with the, the um, Government of Jersey Parks Department in terms of what what they feel would be would be most successful. We're very conscious of the challenging conditions, and there are um, there are illustrative palettes that contain within the DAS, which would would be there to inform any any future development, um, any future RMAs. They've been set out um, if for you know sort of different areas of the master plan in terms of, of species that are appropriate for the most exposed conditions, species that are appropriate for, for uh, more sheltered spaces. Um, and they've been developed by looking at what's worked elsewhere on Jersey, the species that are, have been successful. Um, and, and that is, is set within, within those, um, those illustrative palettes. Obviously those are, those are illustrative and this is really where it comes through into the codes and, and there are codes that require, um, uh, the, the future design to uh, to take account of of those challenging conditions in in setting the um, the uh, the planting palettes and and detailed specification of trees. Um, I think that that probably addresses the the main points that were raised. Unless there's anything that I've missed. I just complement what Patrick was saying that in terms of the daylight, the street width. There's a great variety across the master plan from eight, ten, twelve meters, even up to sixteen meters in terms of street widths. Um, the variety of, of daylight that comes into that, the residential neighbourhood blocks have also got courtyard cutouts, which up to 30 metres by 37 metres. There is a main square, which is commensurate with many urban civic main squares, which again is, is 20 to 30 metres. So there's a great richness and variety of street widths, widths which were considered in terms of giving that character. Um, so I think we're, we're quite confident in terms of the daylight, the forms and have, have evolved out of adequate daylight and enough green space and getting a balance between the two. And sir, if I, if I may just pick up on a comment Mr Young made about the leap of faith, because it's something I obviously said, uh, and linking that to a comment you made about the design codes and how arguably an unscrupulous developer might see those as a fast track to a consent. Um, equally, an unscrupulous development might uh, see sort of a glib design codes as a, as, a, as a passport to saving money on buildings. And I think the, the point is, uh, and what I think is really, really important, is the quality and effort that have gone into the design codes simply underpin JDC's ambition to de deliver really quality, high quality buildings and spaces. I mean, could just as easily have um, done a tick box ex exercise on design codes and not bothered, but we've, as a team, collectively worked really hard to try and predict the sort of quality and the sort of corner cutting that could happen and make sure the codes predicate against that. OK. 
Okay. Uh, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say thank you for those comprehensive answers? It just raises two points that I could be very brief if I could just highlight. Um, on the second one, obviously I'd like to be assured, because obviously one has seen over many years that design codes are all very thorough and detailed, but unfortunately that when it comes to the actuality, they often don't get implemented. I think it goes back to this point about what is being approved and what is illustrative. And so I think it, because otherwise, you know, I've seen over many years, um, planning officers are often put under pressure to, um, to agree um, variations to uh, approvals and so on and set aside conditions, you know, uh, you know, which don't meet those uh, sort of codes and standards. Because if, we if we're relying heavily on those codes, I, I would like to be more confident that they are really going to bite and not just be, um, you know, um, set aside or treated as if they're not fundamental parts of the consent. And the other point is that I obviously I picked up and I stand corrected that what we're not looking at here is a, um, a character area that reflects and he Heli are always the same, but it's a new character area. But I picked up the model of the elephant and castle scheme that was spoken of. Would it be possible to see a picture, a visual of that example, if that's the yeah. model of what we are going to have? Uh, on, on Teams, we have uh, George, who will be able to uh, pull up the images, which are in the design and access statement. It's probably uh, if George, if George is there. Uh, well, I'm, I'm happy if, he, if he's not there, he can see it later. But uh, uh, it's just uh, something that what, I think might George be. Find, whilst George finds those, if I could respond on this on the first the first issue of uh, design codes, and the context of the question was about watering things down. You know, are we going to get those? Uh, the, the points which have been expressly included in the codes. Right, outline is uh, the first part of a two-phase consenting pro process. In this application, all matters are reserved, and the reserved matters, the second application process, is exactly the same, full consultation, full package of material. It is not some... Uh, slim down version of it, there is a second full stage consenting process. And if the design isn't good enough, judged against the island plan, any other material considerations like the framework or the urban character appraisal, irrespective of the design codes, the second stage detailed applications will be refused. Right, well that's okay sir, as long as the decisions are made by the planning committee. They, the and if they are the just being delegated to planning officers I, uh, who are often put under pressure, it's not their fault, but they do come under pressure uh, to... to uh, uh, I, I think the evidence in this forum will quite clearly show the planning authority are strongly independent. Well, I would just like to be assured, maybe if the planning department were able to say to us that they review these codes or these downstream applications, as you're describing, will be subject to full process as, as, under this arrangement. Because it goes back to the point that Mr. Stadden, our earlier discussion, but I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll leave it for the officers to respond when they think it's appropriate. Thank you. So, sorry, before Mr. McCarthy comes in, let's, uh, have we got this visual to look at? Yeah, I wonder if, uh, if the technology allows, I wonder if Patrick could narrate through what uh, these show in terms of the um, general layout and approach. Can you, can you hear me still? I'm not sure. Yeah. Can you, can you hear me? I'm not sure if I'm on audio. I can hear you, Patrick. I don't think, I don't think they can hear me. Can can you, they probably can, can hear, hear you. I can hear you, Patrick, but I don't think they can. George, they can hear you because you're sharing, I think. you Can you just tell them that um, I'll share my, can I, can they put the, put it on me, I can share my screen. Okay, uh, uh, Patrick will share his screen. Let me just close this, sorry. Can you hear me now in the room? We can. Yes. Sorry, I don't think you can hear me while George is sharing uh, for some reason. Um, so this is this is some work done. This was specifically around the Rue de Liberation and the, the scale of spaces there. Um, and, but we used Elephant and Castle as a as a 
uh, an example there or, or a test for what we were proposing in, in a design code and in terms of the setback. Um, worth pointing out that the, the buildings here are, are, are much taller than what's proposed at um, St Helia Waterfront. Uh, I think they go up to kind of um, 14, well, more than 14 storeys. But what this was really looking at is the the street width, the proportion of streets and the offset of, of buildings from um, from carriageways and making sure that we're able to create something which is um, pedestrian friendly, it's green uh, and attractive. Um, it's a very it's an example is a very busy uh, red route, so it's um, quite sort of heavy, heavy traffic um, buses. Um, it has the, the benefit of, of existing mature trees. Um, but I think that that kind of emphasizes what we've we've tried to do in the master plan in terms of allowing enough offset and enough soil volume for trees to be able to develop and and reach maturity and and to get proper sort of broad canopy trees in. Um, this in terms of the offsets and the widths that you see here in the in the public realm, these are very similar to what's proposed um, and set within the codes for the Rue de Libération uh, in terms of the the planting um, planting along the the carriageway edge. Uh, pedestrian routes and cycleways, um, and then allowance for kind of buildings to step in and out and have some kind of greening incorporated along building facades in places um, to uh, to uh, provide additional kind of additional greening and also to just soften the soften the facades of buildings. Um, so this is a very kind of similar example in terms of the the kind of scale of of public realm to one of the the spaces within the the framework plan. Okay. Uh, question from Mr. McCarthy. Sorry. All right. Um, for those members of the public who are watching this online, there's only two members of the public here to speak. So, I'm sorry, it's me again. Um, um, what I want to uh, emphasize on, on my background landscape is I've worked uh, run a consultancy on uh, consulting engineers and landscape design, developing sustainable developments. And landscape, of course, is a huge important part of any development. However, um, what is important is that it was said it was a landscape-led design. Well, it should be a people, a family, a children-led design. And Jersey is already one of the most beautiful natural landscapes in the world. And there's a lot of experts on the island, and it's easy for us to deliver a, uh, a, a landscape of a uh, huge amount of complexity. Um, and But what is also important is where are the allotments? Um, where can people grow and pick and eat their own vegetables? Where are the community gardens? So these things, one of the things that is missing from this planning application is a clear difference between the green space that's shown that is publicly accessible any time, any day of the week, and which are partially, you're allowed there maybe between certain hours, and areas the public are not allowed ever. So also, I'd like to make it clear that some of the roof gardens are shown as green, um, but looking at the heights of the buildings and single staircases for fire escape, I don't think they're usable under the codes. So the bit I'm trying to stress is the usability. And putting this into context, of all the beautiful, enchanting areas that you can enjoy on the island, like the Royal Square and others, this, all of these buildings, in comparison to the heights of the buildings around those areas, all of them are high buildings. They're all defined as towers in comparison. All these, this proposal exceeds the height limitations imposed by the island plan, prepared by the public. This proposed development exceeds the height limitations established by the Southwest uh, Helia um, framework. Now, 
you don't have to, I mean, I, I, I flew in from London and I got here, um, but you don't need to fly into London to tell you about the scheme. Actually, it's the children who have already voted on the scheme. And I take it very seriously, the Children's uh, Youth Parliament. They've rejected it. So they said it doesn't consider play areas, uh, uh, use by children, etc. So they've rejected it. But they're not here today, sadly, because they're at school. But this is another part. So I'll just speak on their behalf of what they've written. They, they are attending. Uh, oh, good. The week. But, but the landscape is what they were, they particularly criticised and rejected. But they're not here today for you to explain why they're wrong. But I certainly support what they're saying. The fundamental aspect is, we've got to go back in history, Jersey and St. Helier was a seaside town. Very popular, my, my grandparents, both of them uh, sides, uh, came to live in Ireland because it was a seaside town and they lived in St. Helier because it was great, great fun and it was on, you're on the beach. And one of the objectives was, yes, we'll fill in the land and we'll build places for islanders to be proud of. But we will reconnect to the beach. So the St. Helier is a beach town again. Now, the SPG stresses repeatedly, repeatedly, it says, you must work with the Jersey Architectural Commission in informing the design. Now, working with somebody is like, yeah, I heard you, but I'm not gonna listen to you. I heard you, I'm not gonna listen to you. That is not listening to the Jersey Architectural Commission. And the first report they wrote when they first saw this scheme, led by and chaired by David Pritchard, who is one of the world's best urban designers, understands landscape, but most important of all, understands people. When he was invited to the workshop done, uh, led by Rob de Hamel, he stressed, this is not a master plan. This is a homegrown solution responding to islanders' needs. It will come out from the islanders. And he's repeated that in his first very review by the Jersey Ar And Mike Waddington should know this, because he was on the Jersey Architectural Commission review, but now he's working for the applicant. Some people call that revolving doors. But David Pritchard, um, when we actually look at uh, the connectivity, we've got, this is, a, say, this is for 3,000 people. It is, um, and then if you can, it, what should be happening is the, uh, the, the Elizabeth uh, Marina should, uh, uh, port should be ready for more housing, 1,000 homes, so maybe 6,000 people. That's what should be being doing. And it's how do you connect? Well, if you look at this motorway, you know, for 100,000 people, this, this motorway, I call it motorway, because it's designed as a motorway. It's got big lamps. It's all civil engineering work. We call a project by big boys with big toys. This is a small little town. I mean, the importance is to downgrade it. Now, I don't know any of you have been to the Strand. The Strand has more traffic than, than this road, but it's designed for people to cross, for activity, for shops, not a 40 mile an hour motorway. And this is one of the most important statements made by uh, uh, David Pritchard, Reduce the speed limit. C calm the whole thing down. It's noise. It is a, it is a scar across uh, St. Henry. So, yeah, you don't really care because, to be quite honest, the scheme I'm looking at could be built anywhere in the world. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really relate to St. Henry. But what it is, as far as landscape's concerned, is green lipstick on a gorilla. And what do I mean by a gorilla? I like gorillas, but what I'm trying to get across is then we move into the spaces. Now, I'm trying now to focus on not a drawing that says, oh, lots of green, very green, usable spaces. I also know and if, the green, if the green space is not used, it comes a dog toilet, and then the next thing is a developer pops up and they build on it, as they already have done uh, around La Collette, the back of La Collette. So what is terribly important is that 
the space, the green space, is the only protection of that green space is it is utilized. This most important thing, and if you go to any successful Victorian uh, beach town, they're right on the water edge, right up against the water edge. So when the wind picks up in the, in the range, you can immediately retract into the cafe area where you're still seeing the sea, and then you creep out again. This is terribly important. You, you don't want to you know, take your kids there. Is it going to rain? Is it going to? Well, yeah, you go there for the day. So building a park that separates is just another barrier you've just created. Now, this park... Mr. McCarthy, I'm going to need to break right, for lunch okay. soon. But this park, when we deal this park, is a swamp. It is below sea level. You can't see the sea. So when you're sitting in there with the wind coming over, which you'll get turbulence because it breaks over like a wave, you, it, all your paper will fly everywhere, you can't see where the wind's coming from. That is terribly important when you're uh, dealing with the issue of comfort and, and wind. The, the, the other aspect, I'm just going to focus on one element. One element is the health and well-being of space and the activity. And swimming is hugely important. You have a fabulous swimming pool today. We have one. Yes, it could be uh, cleaned up and tarted up, fine. But it is, sees the sun from sunrise to sunset. So we want everybody swimming. Now, this is the Lido that will be used all year round, I hope. And what is terribly important about a swimming pool, it sees the sun from sunrise to sunset. This swimming pool will not see sunlight at any time of the year until fully, that means the whole swimming pool and the bathing area, until late afternoon at the earliest. Now, the other dangerous aspect about the swimming pool is having sunlight that casts half the swimming pools in shadow, the others in bright sunlight. If you ever speak to a beach guard who's maintaining the safety of children in a swimming pool, this is an extremely dangerous pool for children because their eyes can't see the child in the, the, the eye, because their eyes constantly trying to deal with the difference of the reflected light from shadow to, to clear. And I will finalize on the most important thing about the Jersey Architectural Commission's review. <coughs> I just can't believe this. The last review done by Jersey Architectural Commission on this scheme was not done by David Pritchard. I don't know what happened. It was done by Andy of Field and Clegg, who just so happens to be employed by the applicant for the worst scheme <coughs> up at South Hill that has been rejected once by our politicians. It has been rejected twice by elected politicians. So now the same client is taking action to appeal, take legal action against the public, using public money against the public. So you have to ask yourself, how come we've ended up a situation where we have a Jersey Architectural Commission that started off by saying... Sir, this, can, can this, I so, just clarify, the applicant is not taking any legal action in relation to South Hill against the government. The well, it's, an appeal, it's, 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 it's a legal Lodging process. Appeal, of, as, of, as it's entitled yes, to. Uh, yes. What I meant was that it is, in the sense, going to be judged but it's not going to be judged by the public and their elected politicians. It's going to be judged by one person. And well, it's, sorry, it it's ultimately be... going to be determined by oh. an elected okay. member. Okay. No, no. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I this was a period yeah. upon for the the advice. questions for us uh, as well. Yeah. We, we seem to be having... I didn't interrupt you. But... Are we having a period for questions? No, no I haven't. I'll just... Well, I'll stop. If you want me to stop, I'll stop. Uh, it's not my decision. No, but you've just stopped me. Well, well look, I, I think, Mr. McCarthy, just before yeah. you, you get up, you, you're, you're raising up... I would urge you to be a little cautious about some of the allegations you, you direct at, towards the, the applicant. Uh, I'm, I'm not here to stand in judgment on, on those matters. Um, this, this is a planning inquiry based on the, the evidence before me. I think a lot of the points that you raise, they are going to come up in subsequent sessions, yep. particularly things around the, the pool, sunlighting, daylighting, so on and so forth. We, we, we will explore them. 
and I, I, my steer to you would please don't use every opportunity to uh, make a, a lengthy speech because we're now... No, 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 I'm just, I'm uh, sorry, but I, I, I do want to say one thing. If there was a, a, only two people from the members of the public, if there was, an, a, say, ten people, you would be listening to ten people, and I'm sorry you hear me, I'm sorry, I apologise for that. I much prefer I didn't have to speak, but I'm the only... only person with John that's here to... Well, to... this is a public inquiry. As many members of the public and, who and wish to come here will do so, and uh, if if there is a limited showing, there's a limited showing. I, I, and, I will and... accommodate whoever whoever comes forward. Oh, absolutely. And sorry for... Okay. All right. Well, let, let's draw a line there. Um, I, 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 we obviously need to pick this up after the break. Um, shall we come back at um, 2.15... That be okay. Uh, that's fine. Uh, in terms of the next element of the program, it will be my assumption we carry on with our witness. Or uh, I'm just thinking about prepping uh, uh, Sarah, who is waiting on teams. Um, I think we probably just just need to when, when we resume, we just need to take stock of where, where we got to. There's probably a little bit of finishing off to, okay. to do on that, and then. Uh, she may be on maybe about half past two, so something like that. Thank you. Um, yeah, and we'll... we have our position to <coughs> you, you... Our, our position to present on those matters. Discuss. Yes, yeah. of course, yes. Yes. Uh, it's going to be a bit busy this afternoon, but uh, hopefully we'll get there. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a break there. <laughs> 